Hello, I'm Svetlin Naku from Softuni, the Software University. We are here again with my colleague George Kirkiev to continue teaching this free Java Foundations course, which, as you already know, covers important concepts from Java programming such as arrays, lists, maps, methods, strings, classes, objects, and exceptions, and prepares you for the Java Foundations official exam from Oracle. In this lesson, your instructor George will explain the concepts of objects and classes and will give you real-world examples with live Java coding. In programming, objects hold a set of data fields. For example, uh, the Peter's birthday object could hold a date 27 plus a month 11, which is November, plus a year 1996. In Java, developers can define classes to describe a particular structure of an object. For example, a date-time class could contain a day, plus a month, plus a year, all of which are integers. Classes in Java typically hold fields to keep objects data, plus constructors to create and initialize objects, and methods to implement functionality related to the object's data. Let's learn how to use objects and simple classes in Java through live coding examples, and later to solve some hands-on exercises to gain practical experience. Let's start! Before we dive into the course, I want to show you the SoftUnit JET system, where you can get instant feedback for your exercise solutions. SoftUnit JET is an automated system for code evaluation. You just send your code for a certain coding problem and the system will tell you whether your solution is correct or not and what exactly is missing or wrong. I'm sure you will love the JET system once you start using it. Let me show you how you can submit the solutions from your hands-on practical exercises to the automated grading system, the so-called soft unit judge. So you have a judging system designed to send you your code and it tells you whether the code is correct or not. And I will show you how it works. You open this link and you go on this, uh, on this, uh, website where is in the soft unit judge and you click click practice and you have this full java full foundation course these are the the problems and here you you put your code just like it's shown here and you submit and you send it so for example let's the first problem student information is this one and this is your solution in java and you want to check whether your solution is correct or not you click submit and it appears here so you can refresh in a few moments and it tells you whether your code is correct or not if you put some incorrect code for example uh, i will format incorrectly the age and the grades of, of, of the uh, of the output and when i click here it tells me that i have all the tests wrong and in this case i can click the details and i can see that it, the expected input is like this uh, the, and my output is this one at, at the right i have one additional digit which is which should not be there so this is how the judge system works it will be your best friend when you are learning uh, java through our training courses because uh, as I repeat many times, uh, learning Java is mostly coding and less watching videos. So you need to practice. That's why we have prepared a lot of coding exercises for you. And please do them because I want you to become Java developers. Before the start, I would like to introduce your course instructors, Svetlin Nakov and George Gurgiev who are experienced Java developers, senior software engineers, and inspirational tech trainers. They have spent thousands of hours teaching programming and software technologies and are top trainers from SoftUni. 
I'm sure you will like how they teach programming. Hello everyone, this is George, I'm a technical trainer, and today we will be talking about objects and classes. We'll see how to use them, what they are, why do they exist, how do they help us in implementing our programs, how the industry, industry uses them, and so on and so forth. So, what is our table of contents for today? What should we cover? What are our topics? Well, we'll start by talking about what objects are and we'll see that we have actually used some of those already, but now we will see them more explicitly as uh, a concept in programming and see how that fits in with everything else we've seen up to this point. Then we'll talk about classes, which are basically the data types of objects, just how an integer variable has integer as its data type, in the same way, a string object has string as its class. It's basically the same concept. However, classes can be created by you as a programmer. We'll talk about the built-in classes that you can use in Java and in pretty much all other programming languages that follow the object-oriented programming model. And then we'll talk about how we can create our own classes by defining their fields, we'll talk about how we can create constructors which initialize our objects, and we'll see a few tasks involving using methods on these classes and implementing our own methods, and we'll play around in general with the concept of object-oriented programming. Although this will be just a first step a venture into the world of object-oriented programming, it won't uh, cover everything. We're just getting started, so bear with us. We, we will have lessons in the future which will cover the more advanced topics of objects, classes, inheritance, polymorphism, and so on and so forth, all those interesting object-oriented pro programming uh, concepts. But for now, we're just talking about how we can create them, how we can use them, and seeing a quick and dirty demonstration of what they look like. So, objects and classes. Now, before we actually start with the material itself. Let's see what we can do with what we already know. So suppose we have uh, a task in which we need to input information for, let's say, a student or, or a lecturer maybe, uh, or a car, um, or whatever else we want. To. Okay, let's, let's uh, settle upon something. Let's use the very classical and very unoriginal example of a student. Okay, so what does a student have? Well, they usually have a name, they sometimes have a student number, and they have, let's say, an average grade. So some information which we can input for our student, save it, and print it out. So let, let our task be read uh, information about the student from the console, and then print it back on the console in a certain format. So let's say we have the information like so. We have the student's name, Let's work with single names only for now. So let's say the student name is um, George. And then we will have the student's ID, like the ID in the, in the university. For example, 123123. Let's say our IDs are always six digit. So we have at the most 900,000, 900, you get it, 999 followed by 999 as a number of a student. Okay, so that's our top number and this is one of the numbers in the um, uh, in the student uh, log or database okay so what else do we have we have the average grade of the student so let's uh, figure out some system in, in which we will be grading the student let's say that the minimum value for a grade is two and the maximum value for a grade is six so if you get the two you fail and if you get the six you pass that's pretty much like in the um, American system, the A is a six in our system and the DF is a two in our system. Okay, so uh, let's say that uh, George, your lecturer has um, the score of 3.0, which should give you a lot of hope about this lecture. And that's what we're going to be reading for our student. Okay, so what do we need to read that? Well, we already can create, inf uh, can create uh, memory in the computer which represents this data, this input. How do we do that? Well, we need a string for the name, and we'll call it name, since that's the student's name. Then we'll have this identifier, the student identifier, or student number, or whatever you want to call it. I'll call it an identifier, because it 
uniquely identifies one of our students. So let's say this is, uh, what is the data type of this thing? Well, it's a six digit integer. So we'd, we'd be okay with using int for it. I was thinking about short, but short won't cover all the possible values because short reaches up to uh, 65,536 values. And we have a lot more than that in these uh, numbers here. So let's go with integer. And usually you would, you would go with integer. In most cases, integer is the preferred data type, even if it uh, covers more than you actually need. Okay, so an integer ID. And what else do we need? We have the average grade for the student, i.e. the sum of all his uh, grades divided by the number of those grades. So that will be a double and we'll call it grade or average grade. Okay, let's go with average grade. A bit more descriptive. Okay, so how do we read those things from the console? Well, let's create a scanner. We've done this a hundred times already. That's reading from system.in and I'll save it in a new scanner over here. By the way, you might have noticed that I'm keeping the parse numbers method from the pre previous lesson. Why am I keeping it? Because if, I, if we need it in this lesson, I don't want to write it again. And since it's separated in a separate method, it doesn't really interfere with the code we have in main. Okay, so we have a scanner. So let's read scanner dot next line for reading the name or maybe next string will be enough. But let's say we have all of these on separate lines, so, so reading is easier. Okay, so we're reading a line for the name and we're, we'll say that the name gets initialized by this line, which we just read, oops, which we just read from the console. And then we'll have the ID read from the scanner again. We can use next int for this input. And then we do the average grade. Okay, so average grade is scanner dot next double. Okay, so that's what we have. And let's say we want to print this. Okay, so how do we print it? Let's say the format should be the student name followed by a bracketed ID. So one, two, three, one, two, three. And then the grade or uh, let's say dash the grade. Let's say this is our format. Okay, so how, do, so how do we do this? How do we print this information? Well, we'll use a system.out.printf, print a formatted string, and the formatted string will be what? Well, let's copy this string, which I just entered, and we'll now replace it with the information which we need to add. So let's provide the parameters. Let's say this is the name parameter. This is the ID parameter. And this is the average grade parameter. And we want these listed over here instead of the string I just entered. So the first parameter is a string. The second parameter is an integer, which means digits. And the third parameter is a floating point number. Okay, so let's print that to percent F and let's see what happens. Of course, we will need to input this data, which we just entered. We'll wait a bit. Okay, so up to this point, nothing really out of the order ordinary. Let's input our student name, George, it, his ID of one, two, three, one, two, three, and his grade of 3.0. Okay, so what did we get printed? George, one, two, three, one, two, three, three point zero, 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 and so on. Why did we get so many digits over here? Because we didn't space specify how many digits we wanted printed on the output over here when we specified the floating point output. Okay, so Java just prints whatever it uh, can for our uh, floating point number. Okay, we don't care about that that much. The point of uh, doing this example here is to illustrate that when you're writing software, the typical case is that you're handling data and for example, reading that data, printing it out, uh, sorting it or modifying it in some way or doing calculations based on it and so on. And in most cases, that data will be a combination of strings, numbers, floating point numbers, sometimes bytes, which you need to parse into something else and so on. So the typical case for a program is actually that it represents objects from the real world. In this case, this over here 
is the object we're, which we're representing. We're representing it through a few fields, three in this case, and these fields always go together. So we have a name that always goes with the ID, which always goes with the average grade. But in our code over here, we have them separated. So we have three variables, which we need to know that we need to use together, even though which we're always going to be using them together when we're describing a student. And at some point we might uh, decide we can add more fields to that student and so on. So this presents a limitation on what we can do up to this point with our code. So we can do, we can code any program which we want. We can make the computer do anything that is computable with the knowledge up to a race. So once you know about the race and once you know about loops and conditionals and so on, you can do anything. But that doesn't mean it's easy and it usually isn't done with just a race. So let's since we've touched upon the subject of a race, let's talk about how we can uh, input more than one student. So we want to keep the information of not just George over here, we want to store the information of another student, say Peter, for example. So here's Peter, here's his uh, ID, and let's say Peter is a good student and, and has the grade of 6.0 from all, all his courses. Okay, so how do we store Peter now? Well. We have one option, which is to just create three more variables and store the information for Peter in them. But that wouldn't be ideal because we'd be doing the same thing we're doing for jerks, hence when we're, we'd be repeating code. Okay, so with the knowledge we have right now, how can we handle this situation? And for example, let's say that um, we're, we're going to have another input which says how many students we need to read. So in this case, two students, which are George and Peter. So how do we handle this, this case? And if this number two here can change, if, if it can be larger, a lot larger, for example, 100, 1,000, 100,000, what would we do? Well, we obviously need an array. But how would we store the data in that array since here we have three variables and all, all of them have different data types? We can't push them all into the same array or the same list because if we push them into the same array or the same list, well, they would have to be of the same data type and they aren't. They are different data types which go together. So one solution in this case, in this case, if we don't have the knowledge which we're going to acquire in this lesson, is to create a few so-called parallel arrays or parallel lists, doesn't really matter if they're arrays or lists in this case. Let's use lists since we've uh, talked about them in last lesson. So we'd, we'd create, instead of three variables, three lists. So a list of integers, a list of strings, and a list of doubles. Okay, so how do we uh, proceed from here on out? Well, we create a new list for each of these, and then we keep these lists parallel and what do I mean by parallel? Well, I mean that we want the, the list name, and it won't be name, it will, it will be names and IDs and average grades, since there are more, multiple of these. Okay, so instead of just uh, adding a single name, a single ID, and a single grade in, a sing, in each of those being a single variable, we'll create a list of names and then we'll create a list of IDs and then we'll create a list of grades and we'll keep the uh, values for a single student on the same index in each of those lists. So we'll get names zero to be uh, the name of the first student and ID zero to be the ID of the first student and average grades to be the grade of the first student again. So we have the same thing in uh, so we have the same index in those three lists representing a single object. Now this obviously isn't very ideal, but it's one way to handle the situation which we got, we've gotten ourselves into. So let's read the number of students we need to read. So this is two in, the, in our example, scanner.nextInt. And since each of these is going to be a separate line, let's just read them as lines and parse them into whatever we need. So I'd say next line and I do integer dot parse of that next line. And that will be our number of students. So number of students or students number. Okay, so number of students. 
And what will we be doing with this number of students? Well, we will have to repeat our input. We will have to repeat these lines as many times as there are students. So we have to do a for loop, which starts from i equals zero and continues to number of students. And then we do this code and we'll create a variable for each of these like we did before. So we read the, the name, let's create it over here. And then we read the ID and I do it with uh, scanner dot next line and then parse this into an integer. Okay, and I do the same thing for the average grade double dot parse double from the next double from the next line on the input. Again, we're uh, saying that each of these inputs will be on a separate line, and I again do this in the loop. Okay, so what do we have from here on out? Well, we have three variables, the name, the ID, and the average grade. And now we put them parallelly in the three lists. So I'd say names, names dot add the name. And then I'd say IDs dot add the ID. And then I'd say average grades dot add the average grade. Okay, so we now have the input of our data. So we're reading from the console a multitude of, in, of uh, data types, placing them in different lists, but placing them at the same index in those different lists. Since we're adding on, on each of these lists parallelly, i.e. we're adding on each iteration into each of the lists, we're going to have the same lists having the same meaning having the same index in those lists describing a single object. Okay, so what do I mean by, by, by that? I mean that now we can start a for loop, which goes from index zero to the number of students or to names.size or to ids.size or to grades.size. Each of these would work because we're keeping them parallel. Okay, and now I can print the information for my student for each of these students. So we're iterating each of the students, each of the indices in our three lists and printing the information from each of the lists. So I'd say names give me the index i and then I'd say ids give me the index i and then average grades give me the index i. So we're printing the same index from each of those lists and we're representing an object with that and that object is a student. So let's uh, say this is our input. Let's copy this input over here. Okay, and we can copy like this by the way. You hold down, hold down Alt and then you slide the cursor to wherever you want to copy. But I'll remove this empty line and this empty line so we can copy without empty lines. Okay, so let's put in this data. Let's press enter. And now we'd see George printed and then Peter printed. Now I forgot to add a new line between them. So I'd say add a new line into this format at the end. So I can print the each of the students on a separate line. Okay, so what did I do there? I just entered some data for, mul for multiple objects from the real world and I got it printed on the console. So we can do this. We can represent information about the real world through a series of lists and each of those lists matches its ID which, with each of the other lists in such a way that the index i of all these lists represents the object i object at that position, object in that sequence, in that order. Okay, so this is one way we can represent information about the real world, but it obviously has a lot of uh, non-optimal uh, pieces put into it. So what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, let's say we want to add another item here. Uh, for example, the student would have an address. So in order to add, to add an address to each of our students, well, we need to have a list of strings, which is our addresses. And now 
in each of the places which we uh, created our parallel lists or arrays, we'd need to add information into addresses too. And the problem with this is that we could forget something. Like, for example, we could add it over here, but then we, we could forget to print it over here. Or in another situation, if we want to remove an item, for example, we have uh, an operation which deletes a student, well, what would we do then? We'd have to remove that student's data from each, each of the lists. So that creates a lot of opportunities for uh, making an error in coding the, uh, the logic of our program. And that's not optimal. When you're creating opportunities for errors, you're, you're increasing the time you're going to be developing your program because you're going to encounter more errors. Okay, so how do we handle this? Well, instead of creating parallel lists, what Java and other programming languages which support the object-oriented programming model uh, provide us is objects. So instead of, instead of having our data, data scattered out through different lists, we will have an, a custom data type which represents a student. And that data type will have a name, it will have an ID, and it will have an average grade. And then we need just one list of that data type. Now, how do we do that? We'll see in this lesson. So, but, but after all, we saw how we can do it without objects. And we saw what the advantages and disadvantages are. The advantages, we don't, know, don't need to know about objects. The disadvantage is pretty much everything else. You don't want to be writing code like this. Well, in some cases you do, but it's pretty rare that you wouldn't create a special object when you're creating parallel lists. There are situations, but there aren't many of them. Okay, so what are we doing here? We're, go we're going to talk about objects and classes. So an object is pretty much a set of named values. So just like we had here an ID, a name, and an average grade, well, an object is just that. It's a set of such variables which represent something from the real world. For example, if you have a birthday object, that would probably represent a day, a month, and a year of that birthday. Okay, so what would that birthday object look like? Let's say it's called birthday, and its day would be 27, and its month would be 11, and its year would be 1996 for someone born in 1996. Okay, so now we have a data type which represents information about a date. And that data type has several fields inside it which represent information about that date. And all of these travel together. So an object is a bunch of variables that are traveling together that can be treated as one thing even though there are several different uh, variables in the program. Okay, so how would we create that? Well. One way to do that with the existing classes of, uh, of Java, of the Java Development Toolkit, is to use the local date class, which just rep represents a simple date with a year, a month, and a day. And we can create that and print that on the console. And this now is an object which has several fields which are traveling together, traveling as one. Okay, let's do that. Let's hide our code which we uh, had up until this point. We're going to be using it later, so I'll save it somewhere. I'll open a notepad, for example, and place it in there. Okay, so what are we doing? We're creating an existing, uh, an object of an existing so-called class. We'll learn what the class is. We'll do a local date, the date, or let's call it the birthday, since that's what we had in the example over here and we'll create the birthday which we decide to. Okay, let's input my birthday. So my birthday is local date, local date dot of, and I'll input my year, 1992, and I'll input my month, which is February, and I'll input the day of that month, which is the first. Okay, so the first of February, 1992. Okay, so that's my birthday, and now I can use this birthday as a bunch of variables which are traveling together. So I could say, give me the year of this birthday. So this birthday has a year, I just initialized it with, and I can get access to that year. Now I can print this if I want. System.out.print, let's say print a separate line with that year. 
And if I start this program, what I'll see on the console is the year 1992. So I have several fields, several variables, which are traveling together as part of this birthday object. Now, what I'm calling here is a method, like, just like the methods we've been creating up until this point, only it is a method which is attached to a particular object. So the get year for birthday will return the year for birthday, of course. And if I have another variable, for example, other birthday, and I say other birthday dot get year, that will return the value for that other birthday. So if I have, uh, if I rename this to uh, my birthday, and I create another variable, which is someone else's birthday, someone else's, else's birthday, and set that to the 2nd of February, 1993. Someone is bound to have been born there. So I'm pretty sure this is a correct initialization of someone else's birthday. And if I print this, if I print someone else's birthday dot get here, I'll get that other birthday printed on the console. So this is another pair, uh, another sequence of another set of variables which are traveling together, which I can access through a common object. So this object binds all of these variables together, the year, the month and the day. And for uh, convenience, we can just print the birthday entirely and Java will automatically print out the information for that birthday without me having to address each of those variables. Now, how does it do it? Well, the my birthday, uh, the, the local date class actually, has information inside it which describes how it should be printed on the console. But we'll see that later on. Okay, so this is an object. The same way, by the way, that a string is an object. So this string we just created, this variable of type string, is called an object. And this, its data type, is called a class. Now, classes are the same thing as data types, like integer, double, float, and so on. But we can create our custom classes, and we can't create our custom data types. And so uh, a class is a subset of a data type. So it, it acts like the data type, but it actually represents represents several uh, variables of some data type, which are bound together in a single object. So string is actually a class. And this variable which we created, the string s containing the text hello, is an object of the type string, an object of the class string, an instance of the class string. Those are several ways of describing an object. All of them are valid. And we will be using them with uh, within our uh, lectures from now on. Okay, so this is the string s, which is initialized which, with the string hello, and this is an object, and this is its class, just like my birthday is an object and local date is its class. Okay, so what do these classes and objects allow us to do? Well, we now can do an example similar to, to the one we had previously, where we have multiple students, but this time we'll have multiple local dates. How would we do that? Well, we'd use a list with these local dates in it. And I'd create this list and I'd call it birthdays, for example, birthdays, and initialize it with a new array list. Okay, so what can I do from here on out? Well, I can use these birthdays and I can read them from the console. And notice that I only have one list. I don't have a separate list for each year, each month, and each day in these birthdays. I have a single list, and it contains a data type which bunches together all of these fields or, or all of these variables. By the way, I'm using the word fields intentionally. We'll be talking about these in a moment, but basically fields are the variables inside an object. So each object, in this case, has a year, a month, and a day. And all of these are so-called fields inside the object. So variables inside an object are called fields. Okay, so let's read these birthdays from the console. Let's say that, like in the previous example, we'll have an integer which represents how many birthdays there are going to be. So I'd say uh, create a new scanner and tell that scanner to read from system.in and name it scanner. And use the scanner to read 
a line which contains the integer representing how many birthdays there are going to be. So I'd say this is int birthdays count. And I'll initialize that with the next line. Of course, I can't initialize it directly because the result of this is a string, not an integer. So I need to convert it into an integer by parsing it. By the way, want to guess what scanner is? Well, scanner is a class. And the scanner object which we're trying to use to read from the console, well, that's an object like I just said. So this, again, is an object. And by the way, guess what? The list is also a class and the birthdays variable I create with that data type of list is an object. Okay, and the array list is also a class. Okay, so this birthdays object will contain local date objects which are read through the scanner object from the console. Okay, so I'm reading the birthdays count and now I just need the for loop starting from zero, continuing until it reaches birthdays count. Okay, and what will we be doing now with them? Well, let's read the year, the day, the month and the day. So I'd say int year and I'd say scanner dot read me the next line, the next line and parse it into an integer. So use the string that's the result of this next line operation and convert it into a number by some algorithm. Okay, so this is the year and this is the month and this is the day. Okay, and what, would, what do we do with these? We add them into the birthdays list. So I'd say birthdays.add, but what do I need to add here? Well, I need to add a local date. So I'd say local date dot of create me a, use the of method inside the local date class to create an object of type local date. So I'd say year here, month and day. Okay, so we initialized an object and we can actually create that object as a variable. So here's the date, the birth day. I almost typed it correctly. The birthday and that then add that birthday into the list of birthdays. Now notice that again we're reading three things just like we had in the students example. But now these three things are part of a single object and we only need to add them into a single list. We don't need to have a list for years, a list for months and a list for days. Okay, so now I can print these objects, so I can iterate them with a normal uh, for each loop. So I'd say birthdays, alt and enter, iterate, and that will allow IntelliJ to auto create our for each loop. Okay, so this is our birthday in birthdays. For each of these birthdays, do the following system.out.print, let's say print f print a formatted string and that formatted string will be um, the year followed by uh, the day with the space and no, followed by the month with the space and then by the day with the space. We can play around with this format if we want, but it isn't really important in our case. Okay, so the, the year will be an integer and then the month will be an integer and then the day will also be an integer. So this is a pretty simple example of an object. Now, how do we get each of these values? Well, we say birthday and after birthday, we place a dot and the dot on each object allows us to access its so-called public members, the things which are available for access from the outside, from outside of birthday. What is available for access from outside of birthday? Well, the year. What else, what else is available? Well, the, the month, get month. And what else is available? Well, birthday dot get day. Now we can have several options of getting the day. We can get it as a day of the month, like we're probably going to need now, but we can also get it as a day of the week and a day of the year. Now this is the reason why we have these get something methods over here, because they allow us to have different representation of the data inside the birthday, even though it is just a field, but that field can be interpreted in different ways and that allows us to print different data for that field. Okay, so 
if we say get day of month, we'll get what we actually want printed. We want the day as it was entered. Okay, so let's see if that works. Now we need an integer, which is the number of dates we're going to be uh, putting in. Let's say again, they will be two. Let's zoom that console. Let's say two dates. The first date will be, um, for example, 2022 or 2024. That's when NASA is supposed to be going to the moon again, or at least so they say. Okay, let's say that that would be in April and that would be April the 1st. So it's more interesting that way. So this is our first date entered and let's use another date, for example, um, 1992, the February the 1st. So 1992, February the 1st. Okay, we read that and something failed. What failed? Okay, so we tried to print something which isn't really a digit. So this is what the format uh, exception tells us. It tells us we got, we, we wanted to print a digit, but instead we got a month. A month isn't a primitive data type like uh, integer or uh, double or char and so on or float. It's actually another object. So this get month thing over here doesn't return a number like get year does. It returns a month. So if we want to get the number of this month, we can say, okay, let's see what we, we have actually over here. We have a get value. Okay, let's see what that get value prints. It returns an int integer so we can play around with it. Starting the program over here, let's enter our input again. So 2024, the April the 1st, and 1992, uh, February the 1st. Okay, what did we get printed? So 2024, April the 1st, again, I forgot to print my new line, so let's add that. And I'll copy my input, by the way, so I don't have to enter it each time. Okay, so a new line over here, and let's start this again. Waiting a bit for the code to start. Okay, here's our input, pressing enter again. Here are our two dates. Okay, so with a bit of a snag over here where we had to get the value of this month. By the way, what is this month? Well, it's a so-called enumeration. Let's see it. Control B navigates me to the definition of get month, i.e. the description of how get month works. And that returns a month. What is a month? A month is an enumeration. An enumeration is just a series of fixed values which can be represented in an object. Okay, so printing get value after that just returns the number of that month in the year. Okay, so that's about it for creating a local date object. And again, you use it just like you would a normal variable, but if you want to access its inside data, you use the dot operator, which we used over, where did we use it? Over here, and access whatever the birthday date can provide you. Okay, so continuing on. Now, uh, we already saw what an object was. An object is just a bunch of values that are traveling together. Now, a class is what describes what these objects look like, meaning what values are traveling together. So when you create an object, you're just creating those values that are traveling together. But if you want to describe what those values are going to be, meaning what their names are going to be, what their data types are going to be, and so on, and then create objects of that, well, you need to create a class. So the class is basically the data type of the object. So somewhere in the Java libraries, local date is described uh, what in it we have code which describes what fields it contains. It describes this year, this month, and this day field. So if we press control B on this local date, we'll see that this is a so-called class and it has a bunch of information inside it. And somewhere, somewhere over here, we can see an integer year, a short month, and a short day. So these represent, as the comments over here say, the year's year, its number, in our calendar, its month and its day. Those are three so-called fields inside the local date. Where did we get, get to? The local date 
class. So local date is the class and birthday is the object. So local date describes what our birthday has inside it. So it's what we'd call here the template for the object, although I'd avoid the, the use of the word template because template means something sp very specific in programming. So to avoid confusion, maybe don't use template. Just think of a class as a description of what is contained inside each object of that class. It's like a blueprint. Classes are like blueprints for each object. Like when you're building a building or building a machine of some type, you have blueprints and each and th those blueprints say, for example, for a car, how, how many wheels it has, what type of engine it has, and so on and so forth. Well, a class is just that blueprint for each object. Just like you use a blueprint to create multiple cars, which look the same and act the same, you use a class to create multiple objects, which look the same and act the same. Okay, and we'll see how we can create those classes, but for now what we need to know is each class has fields, which is the data of the object, the so-called state of the object, the information it stores and the values in that information. So the class defines the fields, the variables basically, the integer day, integer month, and integer year, like we had for local date. We have, we could have data uh, and operations on that data, like for example, getting the day, setting the month and so on. And we have actions which change the object in some way. Now, setting the month would also change the object because, because it would change this field over here. But we could have other operations, for example, remove a date from this date, calculate the difference between two dates and so on. So typically when you're creating a class like local date, you're expecting to have multiple objects of that class. So a single blueprint like local date can instantiate multiple objects and you can use those objects and they would behave the same way. Okay. So, for example, a local date object could instantiate the uh, a local date class, a local date blueprint could instantiate the objects, the birthday for Peter, the birthday for Anna, and so on and so forth. By the way, notice the naming we've used here. Birthday is before Peter. Why? Well, we could have just said Peter birthday. Yes, but that could cause a bit of confusion about how you would name this because Peter is obviously a name and typically names are capitalized but on the other hand objects aren't capitalized like just like i created this birthday over here i, I didn't capitalize it i wrote a small letter b over here so what uh, why did we use this switching up of the birthday and the name well so we could use a non-capital case over here and use the capital case in the next letter. It's a bit of semantics, but it's one thing which you might notice and you might be wondering, okay, so if I can't do this, how, how do I name my objects? And my suggestion would be to, even if it's a name of someone, use the, the lowercase letter for the object name, because what you're creating is an object name. It, it's not really a name of someone. It's not really, um, text in which you reference someone like you would in a book is just an object in your code. So use lowercase letters for objects in all cases when you're using Java. Okay, so the ob objects we created are just instances of those classes. An instance is just that, an instant creation of a blueprint, which is the class. So in each of these lines where we created a list, where we created the local date, where we created, um, actually those are pretty much all of them, uh, where we created the scanner, the scanner, the birthday, and all of these are instances of the class. So an instantiation and uh, a, a way the, the, the blueprint of the class comes into existence. Just like my car is an instance of a certain a vehicle brand of cars. Okay, so that process is called instantiation or object creation or construction. You would see these terms uh, used around, so we're introducing you to them so you're not uh, confused when you're Googling something of this type. Okay, so an instance and an object are pretty much synonyms. So if you say instance or if you say object, it doesn't really matter. 
Okay. And all of these instances usually have a common behavior which the class describes. So your class describes how your objects behave and we will see how we can uh, create our own classes a bit further on in this lecture. But what you need to keep in mind is that all instances of an object have a similar behavior. So the get year method of the birthday of each and every one of these birthdays over here will behave in exactly the same way. It won't differ in, uh, in implementation. So this is the same method, but it gets executed over a different object. And because the data is different, the method returns a different result. Just like when we have a, num a, a method which has a parameter, the change of the data in that parameter allows the the method to do the same things but return a different result. So in here, in addition to parameters, which we can, which we can also add into methods of classes, just that this get here method doesn't have parameters, but other methods could have. So just like you can provide parameters to shift the behavior of the method, you can use the object itself. The method here has ac access to the object's fields and that also changes its behavior, but it, but it actually changes its, re, its result, not its behavior. It, changes, it, it just changes the result which you get from the uh, operation of this method. But the method is the same. So each instance of an object has the same method it calls, but that method works over different data, meaning different objects from the class. Okay, so this is these all of these are instantiations of the date object we already saw how we can use that now a more typical syntax would be something like new local date and you provide the parameters over here just like you do for array lists or strings but local date that specific class the specific utility in the java libraries doesn't have this type of uh, initialization logic it has another type which is this local date dot of but don't be confused by this local date dot of this is specifically for the local date class other classes we will instantiate in other ways just like the scanner class over here is instantiated in this way you say new scanner and you provide a parameter which describes describes from where the scanner is going to be reading okay so your typical initialization of objects will contain the keyword new and the data type of the thing you're wanting to create. For example, here we have a new array list, which we already know represents an array that can grow in size and it does that optimally. Okay, so the local date.of is just, it actually, if you navigate to local date.of, you would see it does a create and that create somewhere over here you're going to see let's see where this is uh, local that create return new local date so this is just uh, a simplification of this initialization you see this is some a somewhat complex initialization it has some logic in it some checks uh, so when you're creating a local date, well, this is what local date dot of does. It eventually reaches new and local date. So every initialization, every instantiation of an object contains the words new and the data type of that object. But some of these classes like local date hide that from you through other methods. Just like you can uh, create a method which is called create array list and that would return a new array list. So it, eventually you get to the point, w point where you say new something, but that new something is sometimes hidden, uh, from, hidden from direct access by your code through that method. Okay, so this is the instantiation concept. Objects are created. Each of these objects behaves independently but their behavior is the same as in the operations they do are the same the data they hold is the same but the values of those data types they hold can be different so different dates can have different information inside them so as i said classes just provide the structure for your objects they're the blueprints so the local date class has the blueprints which say well this should have a date this should have a month this should have a year okay and the plus days and minus days uh, methods are behavior of that local date object. 
Okay, and an object is an instance of these things. So each object is just these fields described in the class, copied into new parts of memory, having different values, and having the same methods which operate on them. So if you have Peter's birthday as an example, that would have a day which has a specific value, whereas in the class you just name the data type, and the object which represents that birthday will fill in that data type with a specific value, and that will fill in the month too, and the year too, and so on. Okay, so this is a brief overview of what objects look like, and what classes look like, and how we use them. Now, we already did some usage of these objects, and I describe, described a bit of the concepts behind how you... Uh, how these classes are created, how, the, how they are described, and so on. Now, from here on out, we're, we'll try to use objects which exist in Java. We'll play around with a few classes, some of which we have and some of which we haven't seen up to this point, and then we'll start creating our own classes. Okay, continuing on, we already saw how we can use objects and classes. Now, let's practice that a bit by using the built-in API classes from Java, like math, like random, like big integer, and so on. Now, there's a lot of stuff in Java which is already implemented and you don't need to do it yourself. For example, a class that represents very big numbers. You already know that uh, int and long are integer types and long has the uh, highest amount of values, but it's still limited. Java has a thing called big integer which isn't really limited, it's only limited by the amount of uh, memory you have on your system. Well, that's not exactly true, it's limited by about 4 billion bytes, uh, yeah, it's limited of, to up to 4 billion bytes of information, approximately, that's not an exact number, but that's a really, a, a really large number of information to store a number inside. So it's pretty much bigger than, uh, it, its highest limit is, is bigger than the number of countable elements, uh, ca uh, the number of atoms in the visible universe. So it's not very likely that you'd be needing anything bigger than that. So there is a class which supports those operations. There are also classes which represent math operations, which represent random, randomness and so on, and we will try to use them in this lesson. Okay, so... <laughs> What are those classes and how we can find them? Well, Java has so-called packages. So when you're looking for something, it's usually in some sort of package inside the Java package, the Java general package. So java.util.scanner is where the scanner class, which we use to read from the console, is located. And java.utils.list is where the list class is located. So basically Java structures classes in packages and you have a big package called Java. And inside it, you have a package called util. And inside util, you have classes like scanner, like list, and a lot of others. So that's basically what Java uses for structuring the code you have in the Java libraries. Now, this is how you find those classes, by importing something from some package. If you open the code which we were editing a few moments ago, you'd see java.time.localdate is an import. And import java.util.star just means import everything from this package. Now that's a bit uh, wasteful, we don't need everything. But in our small examples it's not a big deal. Okay. The list is somewhere in java.util.list, but since we have the import for the entire package over here, we don't need to write that down explicitly. Okay, and if you're searching for something, you could do import, let's hide this one, you could do import java. and then you'll see what packages there are in the Java package. So, for example, java.math. And here you have that big integer class I was talking to you about. So you can use the autocomplete in IntelliJ IDEA to uh, traverse through the packages you can see in Java, or you can just Google them. Okay, so let's return our imports the way they were. 
And this is how you access some of that functionality which is already defined in Java. So to use the existing classes, what you do is just you import the package you need. But more often than that, you just write the class you want, for example, big integer, press enter, and IntelliJ automatically imports that into Java. So you typically don't need to write these imports yourself, but it's a good idea to know how to do it. Okay, so this is how you use them from the point of view of how you find them to be included in your program. Okay, so how do you actually use the objects and the classes? Well, this local date time dot now or this local date which we used dot of or if you use math dot max or math dot cosine or math dot dot sign or and so on each of these is so, is a so-called static method just like just like our main method is and just like our parse numbers method from the last lesson is so these are so-called static members static members are members which you can access from the class itself so if you say local date dot of without needing to have an object before that well that's a static method so static methods are not attached to objects they are independent from objects they are just located somewhere inside the local date class but they're not attached to a specific object as part of its behavior so in this case local date time today which equals local date time dot now this dot now this now thing is a method which is a static member or a static method in uh, set shorter a static method which is accessible from the local date time class just how the local date time class is accessible from java dot something dot something the same way the of method of local date or the now method of local date time is accessible from the name of the class followed by a dot. Okay, so these are static members. Static members do not need an object on which they should be called, just like the cosine function from math. Okay, so non-static uh, members are, for example, on this random object, this random uh, class instantiated object R&D. This method dot next int is an instance method, a non-static method, just like our dot, uh, where was it? Our dot get year is an instance method. This is a non-static method. So if you're having, if you have an object and you want to execute something over that object, if you want to manipulate that object or extract information from it, you will typically be using instance methods. So methods called over objects. You need an object to say get here. You can't say local local date dot get year because which year would it return? Will some of the objects you created year or which one of them? Or should it think about a, a random year which it should return? It local date doesn't have value information. Objects have value information. Objects have the actual values inside them, whereas local date just defines the blueprint. So there is a get year method inside the local date class, but it can't be called on a local year, uh, on a local date. Just like uh, in the blueprints of a car, there are instructions on how to use the steering wheel. You turn it left and right, but you can't turn the steering wheel on the blueprints you turn the steering wheel on an actual car, on an actual car object. So you need to have a car object and then you can call the turn steering wheel method over that object. So instance methods are the methods which typically manipulate your objects or access their fields or change something on them or do calculations through the object and so on. Just like the scanner over here, which we instantiate, we call over it dot next line that causes the scanner using whatever input we provided it with, in this case, the console, that causes the scanner to read the line from that input and return that line to us. Now, we can't call this to just the scanner class. We can't say scanner dot next line. Why can't we call scanner dot next line? Because the scanner class is just the blueprint. It doesn't know from where to read like this scanner object does why does this scanner object know where to read from well because we've instantiated it by passing in the system dot in the system standard input stream 
which system standard input stream contains the data for uh, for the scanner, the, the necessary data that describes where the input comes from. And that's why this scanner can read from the console, whereas the scanner class can't. The scanner class is just a blueprint. Now, th those are instance methods. And back to static methods, the local date dot of method is just a description of how to build a local date. It doesn't access an actual date. It builds a new date from given parameters. Okay, so let's say you have a blueprint and the blueprint says how you create a car. It doesn't uh, need a car to exist to create that car. It just says how that car is created. But once that car is created, operations on that car are done through the car object you just created, like uh, flipping the ignition switch, for example. Okay, so instance methods, non-static methods are methods which you call over objects, where you have an object and then you say dot and then you say the name of the method or the or another member. It could also be just a field depending on the field access rights. Okay, so these are non-static methods or otherwise called instance methods. Whereas the methods which you access directly from the class name are called static methods. And you don't need an existing object to call a static method. Why? Well, for example, in this cosine method example, Cosine doesn't really need an object to calculate cosine with. Cosine is just a mathematical function and is, it is just calculated like a series of operations. The same way over here in parse numbers, we don't really need anything. We just need a parameter which provides the input string from which we parse our numbers. We don't need to call this on an existing object, but we could. We could create an object which gets instantiated through the string line. It, get, it takes it in its constructor. We'll talk about constructor, constructors at the end of this lecture. It takes it as a parameter of its constructor and it, it initializes its fields with that string line and then it just has a parse numbers method which doesn't accept parameters because it already got its parameters during its creation. Okay, so there are very, uh, th th there are a, a whole lot of ways to uh, write code and create objects and instantiate them. And for now, we're just seeing the different ways to do that. And from here on out, we'll be incorporating these different ways in tasks, which we'll, we, we will be solving through these uh, different methodologies, which we're seeing. Okay, so this is how you use static methods and this is how you use instance, met instance methods, that, methods that, would, that should have been clear by now. By the way, the list methods, which you already know and love, for example, birthdays.size is an what? It's an instance method. And birthdays.set at this index, this value, is again an instance method because it changes the birthdays list. It accesses that list, that specific object, and changes just that, not any other object. So this is an instance method. It is attached to an instance. Okay, so that's what are uh, what are use that that's what our ways for accessing functionality from Java classes uh, looks like. And now let's solve some tasks using what we already know about Java and the classes it contains. So we have a list of words over here, and we have to randomize that list of words and print it on a separate line. So for a space b, we have to print b or A, or A and B. Again, this is randomization, so this is just an example of how the output would look like. It's not the only way the output could be uh, printed. Okay, so this over here is another example of how it should look like. We have three strings in the input separated by spaces. We need to split them by those spaces and then randomize the order. Now, how we do that randomization? Well, we can use the random class, which Java supports. And let's actually do that be before we see what we have in the slides as a solution. So let's get rid of this code, which reads dates. And let's read a list of strings. So we will have multiple strings entered on the console. Actually, do we need a list? We have a single line. We have a single line of text 
and we need to split it by the, by the spaces it contains. So we kind of can manage with just an array. So let's create an array of strings, a string array uh, words, and initialize that as what? Where, where are we going to get these words? Well, let's create a scanner and tell it to instantiate itself using the system.in, the standard input. By the way, system.in is also a static member. .in in, is a static member of system. It is accessible without needing to create an object of type system. The system class is just a general representation of the system we're working on, of the PC we're working on. So this system, which we are accessing, has an in field, which uh, redirects to the standard input of the computer. And we pass that on to the constructor of a scanner. And that initializes a scanner object, which has access to this system.in stream. This is a so-called stream. OK, so how do we get these words? Well, we'll need to call the scanner. and read the next line and we can directly split that next line into spaces and that will give us an array of words okay so how now do we do randomize these words well we need to swap around their places now how can we swap around randomly notice that everything we have used up to this point is pretty deterministic it, it can't be random even if you write a random number here for example, you s decide to randomly switch the places of words 0 and words 1, although this isn't really a, a correct swapping, but let's say this. If you, even if you randomly decide 0 and 1 or 0 and 42, this isn't really random because if you start the program again, it will do the same stuff. And even if you do some weird calculation, it will be the same calculation. So when you're uh, coding, uh, your code is generally and should generally be deterministic it should do the same thing for the same input uh, and meaning it should have the same output the same result for the same input okay so how do we randomize this well you might have thought about using the current time because that is something that changes so in order to uh, have non-deterministic output it, it's still going to be deterministic but it's Conditions will not be deterministic because if you start this program twice, it the only thing that changes, the, the, the only thing that really changes is the time, the date of your execution. And then you can use that date to do some weird calculation, some complex calculation, which isn't obvious as a result, uh, and use that to swap around indexes. Now, instead of doing that on your own, you can use the random class, which is... Uh, present in Java and instantiate a random object. For example, let's call this RNG, random number generator, like it's often referred to in gaming, because that's exactly what it is. It's a random number generator. It generates random numbers. How random? Well, it uses the current date, and based on that date, it generates a sequence of random numbers, which you get by how? By saying RNG dot next and you can say next integer next boolean next double it just creates a number okay so uh, how do we use this random uh, object and keep in mind that you need to instantiate the object and then start using the integers the the random numbers it generates you shouldn't instantiate a random generator all the time you should instantiate it once and use it from every everywhere in your program that's the typical case at least. Why? Because as I said, this uses the current date. If you create a lot of these in a loop, well, the loop runs pretty quickly, so the current date won't have changed really. You could have a lot of executions of the loop inside the same millisecond, which is the resolution of this random number generator. So if you have 10 random number generators instantiated in the same millisecond, they will all generate the same random number sequence. So you instantiate a single random number generator and then use that random number generator object, RNG, this RNG here, you use that to generate your random indexes. And how would we uh, reorder these words? Well, what I do is actually I'd create a list of, a list of words, a list of strings of string. And I'd say that this is arrays.asList, convert this list into uh, this array into a list like we did last time convert it into a list 
and now convert that into an array list. Okay. And what am I going to be doing with this array list? Well, how do I randomize words? The simplest thing I can think of, well, one of the ways I can do it is actually swap around two indexes, right? So I get this index, I save it into a temporary variable, then I get this index of Java, I replace PHP with Java, and then I use that temporary variable which contains PHP and place it in, in Java's position. And I do this, that n times, for example, the number of times, uh, <coughs> the number of items there are in the list, that's one way to do it. I do it the number of, uh, I do it as many times as there are items in the list, and then I have a somewhat randomized list. Now, we don't have real requirements of how random our random list should be. So we're fine with just doing some shuffling. We don't need to be perfect in the shuffling. But another way to do that, and I'll use the other way, uh, because the the shuffling, the, the swapping around way is present in the presentation, so let's solve it in another way, so you can see another example of this code. I do the following thing. I traverse words, I do a for loop, so I'd say for from i equals zero to words dot size, and now I'll do the following. Um, this is just, an iteration of words, it's not really, we're not really walking over words. We're not going to be accessing items in order. We're just going to be executing this that many times. We don't really care about the indexes of the words themselves. We just care about executing that many times. And now what we're going to do is say, random number generator, please give me an integer. And one of the options of give me an integer because this can give you any integer from minus 2 billion to plus 2 billion. So what I'll tell it is I'll give it an upper bound. The upper bound is words.size. So give me an integer that is less than words.size. And that would provide me with an integer which I'd call index. And then I will use that index to remove the item from that index and place it in the first position. So I will remove that from the index it is located at and place it as the first item in the list because that's one way to randomize. If I'm picking random indexes which I place into the first position, the first position will be randomized each time. So I'd be inserting at the first position every time a new item. Or if I want to optimize that even more, I wouldn't be inserting in the first position, I'd be inserting in the last position because lists work faster if you insert at the last position. So I just need to insert somewhere. I need to remove the item and insert it somewhere. So what I'd be doing is um, I'd say words.remove this index, remove the item at this index, and place it, the, the item we just got, string word equals words.remove, because remove returns the item which we have removed. And remove, by the way, is also uh, an instance method, which we call over the words list. OK, so we got the word. We removed it from the list and now I'll add it, words.add, at the end of the list. Okay, so I removed it from where it was and I set it at the end of the list. And because I took it randomly from somewhere, I don't know which index I took it from, uh, this will randomize our list. Now, occasionally, I'd remove the last word and place it in the same spot, but that's randomness for you. Randomness doesn't mean that everything changes its place. It just means that some items change their, their place and some items don't randomly. Okay, so that would reshuffle our words. And now if we write a for loop that prints them, meaning if we say words alt enter iterate, that would create a for each loop for us. And, then, and we can say system.out.print line that word, print that word. And if we start this program and enter a few words, we will see them randomized on the output. Okay, so let's input our words. Let's use the example we have here, PHP, Java, C sharp. Press enter, Java, then C sharp, then PHP. You can ignore this uh, bluish 
output it's part of the java runtime it's not really in your uh, program it is just displayed in the intellij console as information for the developer you don't really care about this at this point so we got java c sharp and php they are randomized they aren't in the same order they were although they are now i i would have said they are in reverse order but that they're not exactly in reverse order because you you have initially java and then you have C sharp, which is the last item, and then you have PHP, which is the first item, but Java is the middle item. So we haven't messed up and reversed them instead of randomizing them. This is a randomization, but each randomization has some pattern in it. Uh, if you look, if you have a lot of data and or if you have too few data uh, and you look closely enough, you can always find a pattern. Patterns are easy to find for pattern matching creatures like us. OK, so this isn't really a strict task. It, it's not really a strict expectation for uh, we don't have a strict expectation for the output um, it's just the way you can use the random class it's it's a demonstration of how you can use the random class as a random number generator now if i start this program again and enter the same input again php java c sharp it's pretty likely for me to receive other output although in this case i receive the same output uh, it's pretty likely to re for me to receive uh, other output, but if I place this random number generator inside the loop, if I initialize it every time, this is not a very good randomization. Why? Because this random number generator gets initialized with the same so-called seed, that seed is the timestamp of the current moment. So if it gets initialized with the same seed, it will always give the same index for uh, swapping around. So don't place a random number generator initialization inside the loop. Keep it, keep one or two random number generators, meaning initialize them once and use them multiple times. So because otherwise, if you initialize them multiple times inside the loop, which runs quickly, it's pretty likely that those random number generators will have the same sequence in them. Now, if you want truly random number generation, there are websites which provide that trend, truly random number generation by using, um, for example, the uh, amount of uh, static in, Earth at, in Earth's atmosphere at some point in time at some location on the Earth's globe or stuff like that. So uh, casinos, online casinos, online gambling sites uh, and other um, uh, other places where you really need randomness, non-deterministicity. Non uh, in such uh, situations, you need to use some outside physical output which randomizes your operations. Otherwise, even this random number generator operates on some algorithm. If you navigate to the next stint, you will see the logic it uses. And if you know the seat of the random number generator, you know the random number sequence because you can do these same operations and uh, and know what random what random sequence was generated. So this is the so-called pseudo random pseudo random uh, random number generation. An actually random number generation would depend on some non-deterministic input from an outside system. Like I said, the amount of static in Earth's atmosphere at some point in some location. Okay, but in our, for our case, it's completely sufficient to use a simple random number generator for this. Okay, so the solution we have here in the, the, the slides is a bit more optimal because we're just swapping around two positions in a list or an, in an array, which is faster than removing items and inserting them. Because in this situation, you just access two items. Whereas when you're removing an item from the middle of the list, all of the elements after that item need to be shifted into its position, shifted left by one position. So removing items is a lot slower than just swapping around two positions, but I wanted to show you another solution of this task. Okay, another task we have here is calculating a big factorial. So calculating the factorial of a large number. Now, you know that factorial grows pretty quickly. So one times two is two, one times two times three is uh, six, and then one times two times three times four is 24 and then it's 120, and then it's a thousand and something, and then it uh, exceeds 10,000, and so on 
it, it, it grows very quickly. This is what we call exponential growth of the data. So in this case, the number is the data and calculating for a large number n, it gives us a very large number. So if you're multiplied, multiplying 1000 by 999, that's pretty close to multiplying 1000 by 1000, which is already 1 million. And then you have by 998, which is already pr pretty close to 1000. So it's another, you get to uh, billions and so on. You, you, your numbers grow really fast. You can't place this inside an integer or even inside a long. Long can't contain the factorial of 1000. So what you can do is use the big integer class from Java, which I already mentioned, for calculating this large factorial. So how do we use that? Well, let's keep the scanner because we're, we'll be reading n, like in this case, 5, we return 120. Okay, so we'd be reading something and we'd be initializing a big integer object which will create which will contain our factorial so big integer big integer let's call it factorial simply okay and we initialize it by again saying the uh, placing the keyword new and saying big integer so placing the name of the class the name of the data type over here Okay, what does it want over here? It wants an initial value. Okay, let's call it. Yeah, what does it what does it not like in our uh, oh we can just say big integer dot value of one. Okay, so initialization of big integer, we could have said new big integer and then placed and notice what type of initialization we can do. If we want to initialize a big integer by a string, we just provide that string value inside the brackets over here. So if we're going to be reading this uh, number from the console, we can just use, um, if we want to read it from the console, we can just use scanner.nextLine. So this code is equivalent to integer.parseInt. Now, if this doesn't click right now, why in some cases it's new big integer and in other cases it's big integer dot value of and in some cases it's a new string or new array list, in other cases it's local date dot of and so on. These are just, uh, there is no rule. There are, these are just different versions of classes. So different ways in which you can implement classes. Just like uh, there is no fixed way in which you need to name your variables and there is no fixed way in which you need to read from the console. You can use the scanner, but you can use either next int or next line and then parse it into an integer. So these here are different because they have been coded differently and your classes, once you start creating them, well, they will be coded differently too. So the, don't get bothered by the fact that all of these are different and uh, don't get bothered by the fact that you can't remember how each of them is initialized. I don't remember them either. When I need to create a big integer, I just try around the different methods it has. So I first, you saw what I did. I just say set new big integer and I saw what I can pass in here. How did I do that? I placed the cursor between the brackets. I pressed control and P and that listed the types of initializations I can do. So I see here's a byte array. I don't really know how to input that. Well, I do, but let's say I don't know how to use that. Uh, then I'll try another one. So sign num and byte magnitude. Okay, this seems complex too. I won't use that. I just need to in initialize a number. Okay, string value and the radix. Radix means numeral system. So radix 10 means parse it in our numeral system, whereas radix uh, two means the binary numeral system. Okay, so do I really need to provide the radix though? Oh, I have an option here which doesn't accept the radix. It just, uh, it, it probably assumes this, uh, the decimal numeral system. Okay, so I use that. And there are a lot of other options I, which I can use. And if I don't know how to use them, I would just open Google and search for them. I don't try to remember all of them. I just type in, okay, create big integer from number. If I type that into Google, so if I say create big, in, big integer from int or from long or from string, well, I'll get a result which tells me how I can do that. 
programming isn't isn't about remembering stuff programming is about knowing where to find something and being good at searching okay so after all we're programmers remembering stuff is the job of computers our stuff our our job is to know how to create that stuff or how to use a computer to find that stuff okay so don't worry if you don't uh, figure out immediately what to use. It, it takes time and practice and I know all of, I know some of these methods, I don't know all of them. I know that big integer will pro probably get have a value of, big integer dot value of. It will have a static method which accepts a parameter and that parameter initializes the big integer with that value. Why do I know? Well, because I've tried it a lot of times and I kind of remember. But if I don't remember, I'll just Google it. Okay, so big integer dot value of, and now what do I provide as a value? Well, the first value of the factorial, if I look it up on Google, I'd know that the, the factorial of zero is one, and the factorial of one is one, and the factorial, factorial of two is one times two. So I always start from one. Okay, so my factorial is going to be big integer dot value of one. And now, what do I do? Well, I want to uh, read n, I have my scanner, I want to read n and multiply big factorial by the next number in the sequence of numbers until I, until I reach n. So I'll read from the scanner a new, I'll just read the integer directly, I'll read an integer and I'll say this is n. Why do I call it n? Well, because that's what they call it in the problem. Okay, so n is my number and from here what will I do? Well, I'll start a for loop, I'll think about whether it should be from 0 or not and I'll continue that loop until I reach n, but I'll, until I reach n inclusively, so I'm reading up to n inclusive, not uh, just uh, before n, because n factorial includes n in the multiplication. And now what will I do? Well, I don't want to actually multiply by zero because that will give me zero from here on out, whatever else I multiply in. And I don't really care about multiplying, multiplying from one either because one multiplied by anything is just that thing. So I'll start from two. So from two to n, I'll multiply into factorial. So how do I do that? I'll call factorial dot let's see multiply okay so i can multiply by something what do i multiply by another big integer well i already know how to uh, create a big integer i say value of and i place i over here okay so what does this do well be careful when you're using such methods study them and see in the documentation online what they do because this doesn't modify the factorial method and actually um, result dot big integer here uh, is highlighted by uh, I mean multiply here is highlighted by IntelliJ that we're losing the result of multiply oh a result of multiply so what does this do it actually returns a new big integer so it creates another big integer which can contains the multiplication it's not the it's not a modif f modification of this factorial which we have here it's a creation of a new object so since this factorial will remain the same and this multiplication will create a new object, well, I'll just assign it back to the object I'm using for the multiplication. So I say factorial equals factorial multiply by i. It's pretty much the same as if factorial was a normal integer. I'd say factorial equals factorial multiplied by i, right? But since factorial isn't a normal integer, it's an object, it's, it represents an integer, but it is an object, and that object can't be multiplied directly. Only numbers can be multiplied directly in Java. So in that case, what I do is use the functions which the big integer class provides me, which in this case is the multiply function I need. Okay, so I have the factorial multiplied into itself, and now I just need to print it on the output. Okay, how do I print it? System.out.println. Let's print that factorial factorial okay but uh, is that factorial can that factorial be printed directly on the console well let's see when you wonder whether or not something can be printed directly on the console what you do is place a dot here and say to string and when you add this to string here this 
is a description of where the logic for converting this thing to something that can be printed to the console is located. This, by the way, is also an instance method. And now you go over here and press Control B. And if it navigates you to the class which you're using, in this case, biginteger.java, you can pretty much bet that this can be printed directly on the console and it will have a meaningful value. Now, why this is, it's it's based on something called inheritance and, uh, and polymorphism and overriding methods. Basically, what happens is Big Integer describes how it wants to look on the console in itself. Now, if this had navigated you to object.java or something other than the class you're using, it's not guaranteed, uh, if, it didn't, if it navigates you to object.java, it's guaranteed that you won't see anything reasonable on the console. You just see the type of the object you're printing, not the value of that object. But if you see something else, there is a chance that uh, it will be printed automatically on the console and you don't need to worry about it. Okay, so in this case, we just print to string. Now, if, if you arrive in a situation when, in which you can't print directly, well, you would have to print the, if this big integer didn't have uh, a way to be printed on the console directly, well, what would we have done? Well, we'd just start dividing it by 10 to get its last digit and print that, or add it into a string, and then print that into a re uh, in reverse, because if we're taking the last digit, we'd need to uh, print that in last position. Okay, so there are a lot of ways to do this, but since big integer has a two string implementation it it has its own description of how it wants to be printed on the console we're fine by just doing this okay let's start the code now and see what it does now for five i'd expect 120 and i got 120 okay so i have a mid case let's try the border cases let's try zero and i got one this is the correct uh, value the correct result for a factorial, factorial of zero, at least according to what mathematics say. So I'll accept that as a true result. One, it returns one. Okay, so now I've tried with the border cases of zero and one. I've tried with an average value of five. Let's try with something that we do, we know won't fit in uh, integer or won't fit in long. Let's try with something large. Okay, so we have an example here for 10. It's going to be a lot. Let's see if there's a bigger example. 88. Okay. Let's see if we can use 88. And we got this huge result. Now, how do you check that? Well, a lot of ways, but what I do is copy this value, open PowerPoint, press Control F and paste it over here and see if it matches. Okay. So it seemed that it seems it matched with this, maybe not with all of the zeros, but it could be the case that these zeros here don't match completely or that PowerPoint didn't match completely. Another way to do it is by using some sort of diff tool online. So you just Google diff tool uh, or compare strings or something like that and paste the value which is expected and then paste the value which you have and see what happens. Okay, so we got a pretty big value and we're assuming that this should be the correct factorial for uh, this uh, operation. Now, I could have missed something. And what I should do is really go around and check all of this. But we won't be uh, concerning ourselves with that. I'll leave this debugging up to you. See if this really is correct. Meaning, how could you see it? Well, you could go on the internet and find a factorial calculator online and see if the results it gives match the results we calculate. And if it doesn't, well, figure out why it doesn't. Where, where, where's the problem exactly? What causes it to not print correctly? Okay, so play around with this code. And at the same time, you will see, you, you can, for example, play around with how you want this big integer to be initialized. Like I said, you can also do it like this, new big integer and place one in uh, a string literal. This would parse this number into a big integer. So play around with this code. The, the point of this lecture is that you get yourself introduced to these types of classes and these types of uh, code. So just play around with them. Okay, so here's a solution for this uh, task. We have it written over here. It's pretty much the same that I already wrote. It's just a big integer parsed, uh, initialized from the, the value of one 
although they do it in another, another way. And then we have a loop that continues from 2 until it reaches n inclusively, and we multiply the number by the value of the integer, although this is a pretty large, a, a pretty roundabout way of achieving it. You can just say value of the integer i. Okay, so try to compress this. Try to not uh, use too many initializations inside initializations. Find the shortest way you can create a big integer and use that. That should be your go-to move in any case, not just for big integers, but for everything else. Okay, so we've reached defining classes and let's actually play around with this a bit before we continue to the break. So we'll do a break in just a moment, but let's play around a bit with defining classes before we do the break and then finish up the lecture with this thing again. So we already said that classes are pretty much specifications, blueprints for objects. And these objects are usually objects from the real world, or at least from the business logic of, logic of the application. So if the application should represent birthdays, it would probably have a birthday class. If it uh, represents, and that birthday class will contain a date and the name of the person who has a birthday. Um, or if it represents automobiles, well, it will have classes that represent automobiles, cars or other, uh, other types of vehicles. It will probably have a vehicle class in general. Okay, so classes define that specification. And here is how you create a class. You just say class, and you do this outside of the main method, outside of any method, actually. Then you type, the, type in the name of your class. For example, in this case, we would have a class named dice. And then you open brackets like you open for a method, but you don't place the parameter brackets, you just open the body brackets, the, the scope brackets. And then inside, you place the fields of your object. So let's start with this and then we'll have a break, but we, I want you to see this before you uh, get the break so you can uh, keep it uh, worrying around in your mind. Okay, so you could place your class pretty much anywhere, but in Java, there is a requirement that there only be one class inside one file. So in our case, we have this class main, which is in the file main.java, and the file name and the class name should match in, when you're writing Java code. So how do we create two classes since we only have one file? Well, one option would be to actually, you know, create uh, more files. But since we haven't done that yet, we'll just add our classes inside the main uh, class. Since we're just stepping into object-oriented programming, we'll, we'll have a lot of separate lessons which cover that and creating multiple files and compiling the whole solution and so on. But for now, we're just going to write everything inside the main class. So you can have as many classes nested inside main as you want, but you can't have them on the top level. On the top level, there should only be main. Okay, so what did I have a while back? I had a student, a student which had a name, it had an ID and an average grade. And we'll have a similar task at the end of the lesson, but let's play around with this one for now. Okay, so I have a name, I have an ID, and I have an average grade. And those were a string, an integer, and a double. So how do I compress these three lists into a list containing a single object, which in turn contains these three fields? Just like, so how, meaning the question is, how do I do what local date does when containing several fields? Well, I come over here inside main and I say, class, you don't need to write public even though main has one. You don't need to write it because you're inside the scope which uh, you're going to be accessing this class from your, from your main method and that main method can't see anything inside main so you don't need this public thing. Again, this is one of the things we will need to discuss further on. Okay, so what these public identifiers mean, public, private, protected and so on. So. Uh, what will our class be named? Well, it represents information about the student, so let's call it student. Okay, so what will it have inside it? And now, inside these brackets, you write uh, variables just like you would when you're initializing them. So, let's 
create a variable for the name. You just type in string name and you place this uh, semicolon over here. That indicates that this is one field and here we're going to list another field. Uh, what's the other field? It's the ID and that was an integer. Okay, this is the ID. And then we have a double, which is the average grade. So just like you would be doing in main, so this code would compile successfully in main with the same, pretty much the same result. One difference is you don't initialize them or you don't need to initialize them. You actually can initialize them over here, but let's not initialize them because this is just the blue blueprint for our student. It just says what data types it has and what the names of those fields are. So this is a so-called field. And this also is a field and this also is a field. Okay, so we have the name, ID and average grade fields in our student. And now I can create a variable of type student. So I can say student and I can say student George, for example, equals new student. So create a student object and add it into the student George uh, variable. Now, it, uh, hmm, uh, okay, so I need this to be a static class. I'll explain this in a bit when we continue after the break. Now, what it wasn't happy about when I wrote this uh, class student is that this uh, student, notice how the main method is static. So this is static. Static methods can only access other static methods because it, they're not part of an instance. And since I didn't write st static in front of my class, that static class student became uh, an, an instance member and static members, uh, static, yeah, static members can't access instance members, which look like this. So for now, let's place static in front of our classes. And further on, we will explain why we do that. For now, what you can remember is since main is static, it can only access other static stuff. Now, how does this static class affect uh, the usage of the student? We will see further on. Okay, so we have a student class over here, which is the class student, which contains the fields name, ID, and average grade of the type string, integer, and double. And we initialize an object of that class over here in main. So now I have a student George object, and that student George object has an, a name, it has an ID, and it has an average grade, all of which I can access the way I've written it at this point, uh, up, up to here. So I can say average grade equals 3.0, just like I had previously when we started the lesson in which we uh, talked about how we can describe the information for the student. Well, here is a way in which we can bunch, bunch that information together and access it. But before we see how we should really be accessing these uh, objects and playing around with them, we'll do a break. And after the break, after I've let your minds uh, play around with this a bit and after I've given you a bit of time for you to play around with this code while you're while you're resting after that we'll continue with actually studying how we should be using these uh, classes what this thing is called how we can modify it how we can write our own methods like the to string one or the value of one or the dot size one that the list has and so on and so forth Okay, so this is initialization of a student class. Uh, this is the description of a student class. And this is the initialization of an object called student George, which is, a, which, is a mem which is an instance of that student class. Okay, we got to the point of creating some simple classes. And we actually defined some things, uh, but we definitely didn't place everything inside our student class, which we wanted to, but that was part that was by design. We wanted that to remain unfinished so you can play around with it in the break. And now let's finish that one up actually, because it's interesting what we can do with it before we can get to the actual, actual usage of uh, classes and all of their features. Okay, so let's get back to our task where we had to uh, read students from the console and print them out uh, on the console and we used a few lists to do that. Okay, so let's keep the scanner we have here 
and let's remove everything else. And here's our student over here that we created. Now, by describing our student like this, we have access to all of these fields. We have access to the name, to the ID, and to the average grade of our student. So we have a student object, meaning we can create student objects by using the new student brackets syntax, and we can access their fields, those, these things here, variables inside an, a class, inside the objects of a class, are called fields. So this is a field, and this down here is also a field, and average grade is also a field. All of these are fields. So variables inside a class are, are called fields. And methods inside our class are called methods. Actually, functions inside the class are called methods. And that's why previously you've heard me say, um, we create this function because functions are, func functions are these things which we're writing here, this thing we're calling a method. It's actually a function, and the reason we're calling it a method is because it's located inside the main class. So a function located inside a uh, class is called a method. Uh, but in Java, everything is located in some class or other, so everything is a method. So every function is a method. There are no freestanding functions. If main could have been outside the main class, it would have been called a function, not a method. Generally, that's the rule in programming, although that's a bit semantical. It, it, it really isn't that important, but I figured it would be a good idea for you to know why there is a difference in terminology. Okay, so what are we going to do with our student object, student George over here? Well, well, we aren't actually going to use that one, because what we wanted to do is read a multiple of students, a lot of students, by using the scanner and saying, Give me the next line and parse that into an integer. Integer dot percent of that next line. So here is our array of students or list of students or here is at least the count of the students. So students count or students number. Okay, so this is the number of students that are going to be entered uh, on the console for us. Okay, so how do we read them? Well, we do pretty much, pretty much the same thing we did previously. So we start a for loop, start from i equals zero and continue until we reach students count. And this time we only need one list in which we will be adding elements. That list will be the student list. So we'll call this students and we'll instantiate it with the new array list. Okay, so now we have a list which contains students. Now, we of course need to read the fields for these students from the console again. So we need to read a string name, which we'll, we will get from scanner.nextline. We will need an integer ID, which we will get from scanner.nextline, but we will parse that into an integer. Okay. And finally, we're going to be needing a double, which is average great, which we will parse as a double from the next line in the scanner. So we are reading line by line and parsing stuff from the console and we have our ID, our name and our grade. Okay, but we can't add these directly into the students list. Previously we had what? We had a separate list for each of these uh, fields which we had in our students. We didn't really have objects back then. We just had different fields. Uh, I'm meaning different lists. And each of these lists were synchronized with each other so that parallel indexes in them represented an object. Okay, in our cases, we have a single list which contains students. So what we need to add into that list is we'd say, create a new student, student equals new student. Okay, and we need to set the values of the fields for that student. So I'd say student, student dot name, and set that to the name which we just read from the console and do the same for the ID and do the same for the average grade. Of course, we need to provide the appropriate values. Okay, so now we have instantiated our student and we have initialized its values. So we have given it values for the fields it contains. Okay. And 
How do we add it to the list? Well, the same way we add anything else to a list, we just say the list, which is students dot add the student, which we just created. And now after this for loop completes, it will contain all the students we have input into the console and those students will be accessible and their fields will be accessible from the rest of our code. So now we have objects which bunch together fields which represent information about the actual world. Okay, so how do we print these? Well, let's start a for loop and now I can iterate instead of using uh, an indexed for loop like I did here where I had to keep the index in mind so I could print the appropriate fields, I can do a for each loop. So I can do students, alt and enter iterate. For each student in students, do the following. Get this printing code. So I will reuse the format and I will reuse the way I, um, I print these students. But I now don't have the names list, I just have the current student dot his name and the current student dot their ID and the current student dot their average grade. And that's all I need to do. So this iteration is much simpler than using an indexed loop that relies on those lists being parallel. All of the data is contained inside our student object. And if I decide to add other fields to that student object, I just add them here to the class and then use them over here. Now up to this point, this isn't very different from uh, what we've already created, but let's say that I want to filter out any students uh, which don't have a name, for which the name is empty. How would I do that? Well, I do the following. Uh, I do an iteration of this student list and I do it with a while loop and I'd say int index equals zero and while index is less than students dot size, we've done something similar in the previous lesson, right? We did, uh, we, we had a list and we had to remove certain items from it. In that case, it was remove the negative values from the list. In this case, I'll, I'll say remove all students which don't have a name, for which the name is an empty string. So which have been input on the console like an empty line without any contents in it. Okay, so for each index in students.size, if students give me the student at this index, if their name is empty, so if I've initialized an empty name for this student, then students.remove this index. We don't need that index anymore. Otherwise, increase the index and continue on to the next student. So if the student's name isn't empty, we just continue on to the next student. And that would happen until we reach the end of the list or until we've removed everyone from the list if no student has a non-empty name. Okay, so let's play around with this one. Now, why am I showing you this part? It really, it isn't really connected to our student class or at least it isn't connected directly. So notice that here, I'm just working with a single list. I intentionally mentioned the previous exercise in which we removed values, negative values from a list. Now, it's the same logic. So it's the same thing. We're, we're iter iterating a single list and removing values from it. Yeah, the condition is different, but the code is the same. So we're doing the same operations. We're just using a different condition. Now, if this weren't a, a list of students, if it were several parallel lists, so if we had, uh, like here, a list of string names and a list of integer IDs and a list of double average grades, I'd need to remove from each of those lists the appropriate index. And that makes the code more complicated. And each time I need to add another field, well, I need to remove from even more lists. So I have even more options to fail, even more options to miss something. Whereas this code here doesn't really care what fields I have in my students list, uh, except for the name, which I'm checking based off of. But everything else we don't care about. So this code is abstracted away from the student object. It doesn't really care what the student object contains. Whereas this code over here with uh, the parallel lists 
if I add a removal of uh, students which have empty names, well, I'd, uh, the, the removal would need to know about the IDs list, about the average grades list, and so on and so forth. So any field I add, it would need to know about because it would need to remove from that list. Whereas here, I have a single list and I work only with that list and I don't care about anything else. Okay, let's see if our code is correct. We, we may have uh, made a mistake somewhere. So let's wait a bit uh, and let's enter our input. So I'd say the first student's name is Peter and their ID is, whoops, something failed. So we have a number format exception for the input string Peter. Why do we have that? Well, because we try to parse the number of students. So our, fir our input was incorrect. We should have entered the number of students. Okay, start it again, and I'd say, let's say three students. So, first student is Peter, and their ID is 42, 42, 42, and their average grade is, let's say, six, the best grade we have currently. And here I'll enter an empty student. So, my cursor is on the line, I haven't input anything, and I'll just press enter. This student's name will be empty, and let's place an ID for that student. For example, let's that, let that ID be zeros, and I'd say their grade is 4.5. Okay, and now I need to add the third student. Let's say that's me, George, and George's ID is 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. And my grade is 2.0 because I'm not a good student for some reason. And now when I press enter, this program will finish and it will print only Peter and George. Why did it print only Peter and George? Because the middle student, the one over here, has an empty name. Notice how this line is empty and that's what I told my program to do. I wanted it to filter out students for which the name is empty. And I did this with pretty much the same amount of code I did previously. And that's because I've barely scraped the surface of what classes offer me. So this is a very rudimentary class. It only has fields and I'm directly accessing those fields. Now you notice that the classes I, I already used could initialize with some parameters over here and they didn't access the fields directly. They used stuff like get name, not just name. And there's a reason for that and we'll see it in a bit. Uh, we'll start upgrading this class to match an actual proper class that is to be used in uh, a program. Okay, so this is how a class would normally work. You need the class keyword. Now, until we start adding classes in different files you and using them from places other than main, you would need to also add static. So it would be static class dice and then open these brackets and enter the fields you wish into your class. So static until we start adding multiple files. You can play around with that, by the way. You can add another file to your project and add it as a class. IntelliJ has that support. You can just say, right click on your project, add new class, and IntelliJ will do all the heavy lifting for you. And then you could use your class in your main file without having to write static in front of it. But that's something for another time. And for this uh, part of the course, we'll, we're just talking about single file programs. So the other stuff you can play around with, but for now, keep your code uh, and your exercise code in a single file. Okay, so this is the class. This is its name and the body is whatever you write between these brackets. Okay, so usually you should name your classes like this. So your class should be descriptive. It should describe what it contains, the object it contains, the object from the real world, in most cases, which it contains. And you should name it with a capital letter at the start and each every, wor uh, every next word inside this class name should start with a capital letter. So it's similar to how you name methods and variables, but you also capitalize the first letter in addition to all others in the word. Okay. Now try to avoid abbreviations unless they are really popular, pop, popular abbreviations. For example, URL is popular enough and HTTP is popular enough in, uh, computing, uh, in the computing industry that you don't need to type them out uh, fully. But TPMF, unless your code is very specialized and very well documented, don't, don't use names like this. It's best to just write out the full name of 
the class. And don't use lowercase for the uh, word start letters. And don't try to uh, compress the class names too much. For now, try to name your classes like so. This is much more readable than trying to abbreviate or trying to uh, shorten their names. Uh, just use longer names for now. Okay, F further on you will learn where you need to um, use longer names and where you need to use shorter names, but that's something that comes with experience. So you'll learn it, but you'll learn it by writing a lot of code and seeing what works well and what doesn't. Okay, so a class it describes a state and a behavior of objects instantiated from that class. So the state is just the fields. So this, these variables, these are the structure, the fields of the class. Each object of that class has a state. The state is just the, value, the values of these fields. So whatever values your fields have, well, those values are the state of your class. So the com combination of fields and values gives you the state of the class. And the class also has behavior. Basically, the objects have behavior. Each object can do stuff. For, ex for example, our objects right now only store data, but we can cause them to operate uh, autonomously and we can make them do operations which uh, they currently do not support. Let's see that in a bit. So here's an example of our dice class and here are examples of the fields it has and the state it represents. This is the state that our uh, dice class represents, the fields sites, uh, the field sites and the field type, whatever that would contain. The values of these are the state of our class. This is the state. So changing any value inside a class is changing the state of that, I mean, changing a value inside an object is changing the state of that object. So a class has fields while objects have the state of those fields. Each object has a state of its fields and that's terminology that you will often meet when you're Googling around for something. Okay, so these are the fields and we created some of these fields. Now something that we haven't done yet is create methods. So we have here an, a description of a method and this method looks the same way that our methods, our static methods do, but this one isn't static. It's just, it says public void row. So for our case, void row would be enough. And this is a method which can do something with our uh, dice. Now, let's play around with that for our student class. So uh, our student class has a name and it has an ID and it has an average grade. Okay, so let's, um, let's create a method which, print, which returns a string containing the information of our student. How would we call that method? <coughs> well, let's call it to string. Now, notice that IntelliJ offered a suggestion for the to string method, and it also almost crashed. Uh, IntelliJ offered a suggestion for the to string method because the to string method, as I said previously, is something that is common for all objects in Java. So if an object in Java has a to string method implemented on it, if its class has a to string method implemented, then objects of that class can be, for example, directly printed on the console with meaningful results. Okay, so we could overwrite this one. So we could use this to string method, which IntelliJ generated for us to represent our student object. Now, notice that I deleted this super dot to string. This is something that we will see in other lectures, but since I want to demonstrate something useful for you, uh, I'm showing you this concept of overriding methods. Although if you just want to create, okay, let's, let's just play around with a normal method and ignore the overrides. So ignore what we just got inserted into our class by IntelliJ. Let's, let's just create a method that converts our uh, student into a string. So it gives us the name, the ID and the average grade in the format that we wanted to uh, get it. So let's name this method. It will return a string and let's name it uh, get string or as string. 
let's say a string. So this will convert our student into a string. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, let's get the printing code we just had over here and convert it into not a system.out.printf. So let's not make the student print itself. Let's just say string.format this way and return that as a result. So this is a method. It is located inside our student class meaning that it can be called from each and every one of the objects from the student class. So now instead of using system.out.printf, I just say print a line and that line will contain the student dot as string. So I'm, I'm creating a string from the student object and providing it to the print line method. Okay, how do I implement the code inside this as string? Well, we know how string.format works. It does the same as system.out.printf, but it returns a string instead of printing it to, to the console. Otherwise, the parameters are the same and the behavior of creating the symbol sequence is the same. Now, where do I get the student.name and student.id and student.average grade, which I uh, used previously? Well, I already have them. I am inside the student class. So this method as string is being executed over a student object. And that student object has a name, an ID, and a grade. So these are the fields I'm accessing. The, these are the, the bunched up uh, properties of our string, which travel with, uh, with our of our student, which travel always with the student object, and each student object has them. So I can just say in our as string method, use that name and that ID and that average grade, which are present inside the student class, meaning that when as string is executed over a certain instance of, where, where is it? A certain instance of a class. So if it is executed over this student instance uh, inside the students list, as string, will execute for the name, ID, and average grade of specifically this student. So when the student changes, as string will have access to different name, ID, and average age than when it executes for another object. So each object's as string execution will print a different res will return a different result because the name, the ID, and the average grade will change from object to object. Okay, so this is why it's called an instance method, because it uses the instance data, the data of the specific in the instance, and meaning the fields of the specific instance, and in our case, its name, its ID, and average grade. So if we have an instance with the name George, printing here will print George, whereas if we have another instance with the name Peter, printing here will print Peter, and so on. Okay, so... So this is what we wanted written. We wanted to simplify our printing of students by creating a so-called method, which gets information from the student and returns it in a certain way. The same way our local date class that we used, actually the java.utils local date class, which we used in the previous examples, it had a get month method which actually returned something different than just a number. It returned an object which contained more information. So in this case, we're doing something similar. We're converting our student object to a string using a so-called method, which works on the fields of the current object. Okay, so would this code work? Well, I guess it would, but let's test it out. Copying this input, starting the program and pasting it back in. We'll see what happens. So I press enter here and I got two. The only difference is I got an empty line over here. Why did I get an empty line? Well, because inside the formatting of this student, I have a new line symbol added and I add one more over here where I print them. So I print it as a separate line. Whereas previously I just had printf. So this is the difference of the implementation. Now my preference would be that printing that formatting a student just returns a string. We don't know if this would be used on the same line or on a different line or whatever. So let's not assume that from the as string method. We'll just 
implement the simplest code that formats a string with the meaningful information for our student. Okay, so what do we do from here on out? Well, we now know how to create methods for our classes. Now, another example here would be with the dice class, which has sides and a type. It has a row method, and that row method would just call uh, would just force the dice to return um, a new value, which is the result of the row. For example, that would be done with mat.random. Okay, so now that we've created a method which returns information and wh when we've seen what other methods can be created, our next step is to talk about getters and setters. Now, what are getters and setters? These are just, again, just methods, nothing special about them. But there are a certain subset of methods which generally start with the get and set keywords and modify our, meaning the set methods modify our object state whereas the get methods return our object's state. Now, all, of, all that these do is just the get method returns the field to which it corresponds. So get sides would be just, would just contain the code return this dot sides. So for our student, a getter for the name would look like this. String get name and IntelliJ even suggests that to us. So get name would return this dot name or just return name. Now, every time you type in this, it references the object in which you are currently. If you don't write this, it still means the current object, but there are some cases and I will show you, uh, show them to you. There are some cases where this, where the this keyword is actually required. So it's a good idea to start by using it every time, but Further on out, you will learn where you can avoid it. Okay, so let's keep it simple. Let's say get name returns name, and let's say int get id returns id, and let's say that double get average grade returns average grade. Okay, so I just implemented three so-called getters, and now uh, when I uh, convert our object to a string, I can say get name instead of just name, and I can say get ID instead of just ID, and get average grade instead of just average grade. Now, from inside the object, like we have here, it usually doesn't matter whether you're using the method or you're using the field. It's pretty much uh, equivalent. There are some cases in which you want to use the getters, and in general, in programming, you typically use the getters instead of using the field directly and there are reasons for that and we will cover them in a bit. So this is one thing I can do and now you're probably wondering, well, why do I need this? Like I can already access the field through the uh, field name. I don't need a method that returns the value of the field that just wastes time for me to write it. Okay, and you would be correct in this situation. However, there are reasons you don't want external code accessing the fields of your objects. For example, uh, a typical case for students is that they have a number and they can change their name and they should probably change their average grade with each exam they take. However, their student number shouldn't really change. So you can change your name, you can change your average grade, but the university typically doesn't want you to be changing their, your ID because everything related to you in that university is referenced by that ID. So you don't want this ID to change. So what do you do in that case? Well, one thing you can do is ensure, and there are other ways to do this too, but is to ensure that this ID isn't accessible from the outside. So outside code can't access this ID. And a general good practice is to make every field in your object to prefix it with this private keyword. Private means that only methods inside student, like get name, get ID, uh, as string, and so on, can access these fields. External code can't. So here, after we've, yeah, the, the, after we've created these fields as private, external code typically can't access them. So getters and setters are written in order to allow you 
to access these fields from the external uh, from external places uh, even though the, the fields themselves are private so what you do is make the the getters public so you make this public and this public and you make this public too and you make the as string public too and all of these public things are usable from anywhere whereas the private things are only accessible from the student class itself now there is an exception over here since even though this is private it's inside the main class and since it's the in inside the main class we can still access those fields over here we're not getting compilation errors over here because these two classes are inside one another so the student class is inside the main class and the main class since it contains the student class can access absolutely everything at once from the student class even though the fields of the student class are private however if we move this class to another another file and start using them it from the other file then the private access will kick into effect and we won't be able to use these fields which have private access and now you're probably thinking okay why do i want to limit the access well if you're limiting the access you're controlling what values these fields can take so if you limit the access to all of them none of them can be changed correct again in our case this isn't exactly true because this class is inside main but if i move it outside of main if i say uh, alt and r refactor move and i pick move inner class to upper level that will move my class to another file and once it moves it to another file these lines over here will stop compiling and typically in programming that's what you want to happen because you don't want external code to be accessing your internal data of your objects the same way as uh, when you have a laptop or when you have a clock when you have a clock that clock has external public uh, functionality so the public functionality is the display and this display shows me what the time is however i don't have access to the battery inside this clock and i don't have access to the cpu inside this clock which calculates the time and i don't have access to the machinery inside this clock which moves the the arrows which display the time so and that's on purpose that's an, a principle of object-oriented programming and of engineering in general called encapsulation anything you want you don't want the user to be accessing directly you encapsulate you put in a box so they can't access directly so in my case making these things private i ensure that external users of this code of this student code can't change the name and can't change the id and can't change the average grade and now if I want to allow them to change some of those things, I can just say create a setter. For example, I said that I want the name to be changeable and the average grade to be changeable. So I can say uh, void set name, which accepts a string name and sets to this name, sets the name that was supplied as a parameter. Now, why am I doing this here? Well, because now name is not obvious what it refers to so name can refer to the parameter or it can refer to the field now using the this dot prefix i'm disambiguating between the field and the parameter so i'm saying that the field should take the value of the parameter okay so this way i allow my code to set the name and if i want to allow external code to also set the grade set average grade i can supply a setter for that and set it to the average grade field now what happens is that now i have getters for everything so everything can be parsed from my student class but i only have setters for name and for average grade meaning that i can only change name and average grade but i can't change id this is what getters and setters do for you. They allow you to limit access to fields and they also allow you to do checking on the input coming from the parameters of these methods. So you can have a set name which receives a parameter name and if you detect that this name is for example empty, you can ignore this object or you can throw an exception or you can uh, otherwise signal to the program that something wasn't correct. 
or uh, if someone enters an average grade outside of the range you've defined, for example, if in our case the range is between 2 and 6 inclusive, then you would check if average grade is a valid value over here in this code and only set it if the value was valid. Now this is again another usage for getters and setters. Now we will see this all in great detail in follow-up lessons. For now, we just need to know what setters and getters are and how to write them. So setters just are just methods which change the values of fields of an object. And getters are just methods which return the values of fields of an object. So over here, instead of saying student.name equals name, I can say student.setName and initialize the name like, like so. And here I can say student.setAverageGrade and set degrade like so. Okay, so now I don't have a setter for the ID, so I can't say set ID because there's no such method. I only have the direct access to the ID. And I don't even want to have this. I don't want to access fields directly. Generally, in object-oriented programming, you don't want to access fields directly. Okay, so how do we solve this? We have setters for name, we have setters for average grade, and we have getters for all of them. But we want to set ID, but we only want to set it once. So we only want to allow external users of the code to set this ID once and then to allow them to only get this ID. How do we do that? Well, there are a few ways and one way would be to make this variable final, but we won't discuss that for now. We will see that further on when we dive deeper into object oriented programming. Another way to do it, and that will tie in nicely with what else we need to do for uh, studying students, uh, students, classes and objects, is constructors. So what did we say about ID? We want to initialize it exactly once. So we want to make it get a value only when it is being initialized for the first time, for the absolute, absolute first time. So the moment the object is created, we want the ID to be set. And we also want the name to be set and the average grade to be set. So how do we do that? We implement the so-called constructor. So let's continue on from here. We already saw how we can create objects, so we won't uh, stay around on these slides. And we already saw how we can write methods. Here's, by the way, before we continue to the constructors example. Uh, here's a dice class and it has sites and here we have functionality inside the, that dice class. Your methods don't only need to be um, getters and setters and information uh, aggregators like our as string method. They can also be methods which do some operations based on the data and return a value. For example, a dice object can have a row method and that row method can return an integer. And based on the sites of that dice, that die, it's single, maybe. So based on the uh, the site of that die, the, the number of sites on that die, it would generate a random random number, and that random number would be returned from uh, the row method. So methods can do operations on objects, any type of operation, just like uh, the big integer, big integer object had a multiply. It, it had dot multiply by another big integer. So you can write your own numeric cl class. For example, you can write a 2D point class or you can write a complex number class, a complex number class. And that complex number class could have a complex number add method, which adds, calculates the sum of this complex number with another complex number. So this would be a parameter complex number. I won't write the entire thing. And you would be using that parameter inside that method and you would be using the fields of the current complex number to, cal to calculate that sum. Okay, by complex number I mean those numbers which have an imaginary part and a rational part. You've probably heard of them in mathematics. Okay, so the point is that methods inside objects allow you to do behavior. Just like you can write methods inside your main class, you can have methods, same syntax, same operation, same rules for returning values, same rules for uh, passing in parameters. And in addition, these methods have access to the fields of the current object on which they are functioning, unless you mark them static, in which case they don't. But if you miss the static word, 
which we've been using up until now. If you don't use the static keyword, well, then you can um, access the fields inside the die object in this case. Okay, so I, I said that we'd be talking about constructors so we can finish up our class, which we started implementing. So what are constructors? Constructors are special methods that execute during object creation, meaning when you instantiate an object, so when you say um, create, a, create a student, like we do here, this is actually a call to a constructor. And notice that this looks a lot like a call to a method, right? So this is, it has the brackets and everything, but it doesn't have a return type. Instead, it has a keyword here that says new, and the result of this thing is a student again. So you say new student, and that calls a method which initializes the, ob the student object, and the result of this operation is a new student object which you can use. So this is a constructor. This is the default constructor of this class. So when you haven't added any constructors to a class, like in this case, there are no constructors for the student class added. The student class is just the student class. When you haven't added any constructors, Java automatically generates an empty constructor that does nothing. It just prepares, prepares the memory for your class. Now, if you want to make what we if you if you want to do what we wanted to do initially which was to only set the id when the object was getting initialized this is what you need to do you need to create a constructor so this is something that is called only once during the object's lifetime it creates that object it's the birth of that object so it looks exactly like a method however it doesn't have a return type so that means it doesn't even have a void keyword in front of it and it matches the name of the class so for the class student it would be student just that and it can accept as many parameters as you want now this is the this is how the default constructor looks like if you don't add the default constructor it will look like this so it, whether i add this code or i don't that's what the default constructor will be and that's where it's going to be placed it is just uh, an empty method with empty parameters. But I, want, I don't want that. I want to create a student which already has an ID and I provide the name and the average grade for that too. So let's say create a student with a string name and an integer ID and a double average grade. So when creating a student, I'd require the user of my student class to provide three parameters, the parameter name, the parameter ID, and the parameter average grade. And how do I now initialize the fields of the current student object? Well, I say this object dot the name equals the name that has been passed in in the constructor. Now, if you just if you miss the this, notice how uh, this code has been just um, faded away. So this is because the name here, if you navigate if you click over it and press control B you would be navigated to the parameter so we're assigning the, the parameter to itself because here name hides our name which is the field so in order to access the field you just prefix that with this so now notice how the color changed now if you navigate to the field look where it got us it got us to the field if you navigate from this identifier from this name identifier to where it is declared, it gives us the field. Whereas if you miss the this, it gives you the parameter. So that's what this does. It, it allows you to access the field if there's a parameter with the same name or any other variable with the same name, which hides it. Okay, so this is for the name and we do this for the ID as well. And we do it for the average grade as well. So average grade now equals whatever parameter we've been supplied. So this would instantiate the student object and that instance would have a state containing the name we passed in, the ID we passed in, the, and the average grade we passed in. Okay, and now if we navigate back to wherever we were creating our students, notice that we now have a compilation error here. Why? Because we changed this method. Just like when you change the parameters of a normal method, if you change the parameters of the student constructor, well, you can't call it like that, like, like you were calling it previously. 
So now I just say the student is equal to a new student. To I'm, I'm pretty much telling Java, create a new student, construct a new stru student object and construct it with this name, this ID and this average grade. And now I don't need any of these setters. Now we just compressed the code a bit. So instead of having separate lines which initialize our object, we just have a single line which initializes it with all of the fields it needs. We now have the limiting factor of we can't change the ID of the student, so we can't say student set ID. But we can change the name because we have setters for the name. And we can get each of those fields because we have getters for the name, the ID, and everything else. So we have access for reading, but we have access for writing only for name, uh, yeah, only for name and average grade. And we disallow the access for writing for the ID. Now, again, side note, if you just say student.id, this is still accessible, but the only reason this is still accessible is because the student class is inside the main class and the main class can see everything. If you break off the student class into another file, it won't be able, the main class won't be able to access these private fields. Okay, so now we're creating a student from a single line. We're just reading the input for that student and then initializing it through the constructor. Now this has an additional feature. If we add a new field, for example, if we add, I don't know, let's say string address, string address, we just need to add this address to the parameters we supply over here and initialize the field with it. This address equals the address that was passed in. And now IntelliJ will automatically inform us of all the places where we also need to add this. Whereas what in the case where we set the fields manually, we could forget some of the places. If we have a lot of places where we initialize students, now in this case, we only have one, but if we had multiple places where we initialize students, it would be a problem. Why? Well, because we'd have to hunt down each and every one of them to add the, the address setter there to call the address setting to, to, to get the address from somewhere and set it to the object. Whereas here, once we add something to the constructor, the code stops compiling because it can't do this operation because there is no such, uh, b because we haven't supplied the parameter. And compile time errors are a good thing because you can hunt them down easily. The compiler tells you where they are. So that's another cool thing of constructors. Once you create a constructor, if you change it, the compiler automatically shows you all the places where you need to make a modification. Whereas if you don't have a constructor and you just set field by field and you change something, you have to manually find all places where you need to add that setter to. Okay, so this is what constructors do for, for us. They allow us to initialize an object directly. And you can have multiple constructors for uh, a class. For example, I can say, okay, I want to have a constructor which only accepts an ID, sets that ID and doesn't touch anything else. So this ID equals ID and everything else uh, we leave empty or we leave uh, as nos in this case. This would be a no and this would be the value zero. And then we can set it with uh, the setters. So this is absolutely valid. The same way you can overload methods, you can overload constructors. Also, constructors can call each other. So this to this constructor doesn't need to manually say uh, this dot ID equals ID. It can just do this, i.e. call itself, call, call, the, call the object and provide an, a no name, the ID which we got and the average grade, which is zero. Okay, so what does this do? Well, this calls the other constructor. So this tells Java to execute the other constructor and supplies only the parameter we got and leaves all the other ones defaults. Or you can place minus one here, or you can place two or whatever the default, whatever default value you want. You can make the name, for example, empty or say, this is no name <coughs> and so on and so forth. So in this case, we're reusing a constructor. Again, this is another variation of the constructor. Now notice that once you've added the constructor, the default constructor disappears. If you, that's why we had an error here. That's why uh, if we tried to create, where was it? Let's search for student, okay? If you try to 
call a constructor with no parameters, you get an error. That's because once you provide a constructor to class, it loses its default constructor. And if you want to, for it to have a default constructor, you have to add it manually back. Now, in our case, we don't want one. We just want our students to always have an ID. And that's why we always require an ID. But if you have another class which you can accept to uh, get initialized with empty values, you can just add a default constructor like so. Here's the default constructor and you can do whatever you wish with it. And now, if I leave this code in here, I would be able to create students without providing any parameters. But I don't want to do that now because our task is to create students with specifically these values in them. And this code will do exactly the same as it did previously. However, we've just compacted the code onto a single line, the initialization into a single line. And we've also reduced the probability of uh, committing errors while adding fields because we, can't, we now can't miss a field. The only way for us to miss a field is, would be to miss that field inside the constructor. But missing the field inside the constructor is much more unlikely than missing it in seven places where, you've, uh, where you're creating objects. Okay, so this is what constructors look like. They are just special methods which don't have a return value, i.e. Don't, you don't write anything before them. They're always the same name as the class name. And from there on out, they follow the same rules as any other method. And they can access the fields of the class, the internal fields of the class, and set their values. Okay, and you call them with the new keyword. And if we start this code again, we will receive the exact same result, the exact same output. I won't do it now so that we don't waste time. And we have an example here with the uh, dice class. Here we've modified the default constructor for the dice class to accept no parameters but initialize the sides of the dice to six because by default dice are six-sided. So this is, what, this is how we describe our default dice to be. So if someone creates a dice object, it will have by default six sides unless someone after that modifies it using the set sides, where was it? The set sides setter. Okay. So this is how we initialize dice uh, using a constructor. Now, of course, we can add another constructor that accepts a parameter which describes the number of sides. You can play around with this as much as you want. Okay, so uh, as I said, you can have multiple of these constructors in the same class. Uh, you can have one that accepts parameters, one that doesn't. The requirement requirements for overloading constructors are exactly the same as the requirements for overloading methods. The signature of the constructors needs to be different. So the signature of the constructor is just the name of the constructor, which is always the same and the parameters. So either the number of parameters or the type of parameters need to be different. And that's enough for you to have different versions of constructors. Again, this is something we will explore further in uh, lessons to come. But for now, this would be enough for you to create simple objects using constructors like this one and initialize them and use their values and put them into lists and so on. Now, let's see what we can do with our newfound knowledge and solve this problem. We have students in the input and we should read until we receive the string end. Okay, and the format is the following. We have a first name, we have a last name, we have an age, and we have a hometown. And these are all on a single line. So on a single line, we get the first name, the last name, the age, and the hometown. So pretty similar to our student class, only it isn't just a name string, it's a first name and a last name, and an age, which is probably an integer, and the hometown, which is probably a string. We don't need to be any more specific than that. Okay, so, how do we do that? Well, we need to create a class student and set these fields inside it. And then if we receive a student that already exists in this input, which ends at the end string, if we receive a student that already exists, we need to overwrite it. So what does it, what do we, how do we consider one student to already be existing? Well, if the student has the first, the same first name and the same last name, then it's the same student. They've just changed their age or their hometown. So this is basically a simple database uh, 
a, a simple database program which stores student in a some type of database in our case it would be easiest to for it to be a list okay and then modify some of the values inside the data that database that list and at the end we even have a query to our database so we will receive a city name so a string uh, for the hometown and we should iterate all students and only print those which are of a certain city so only print the information for those students so what would we need so we have we can pretty much follow whatever uh, description and business logic they have here so we have a first name a last name an age and a hometown so we need a student class which has these fields let's start by that I'll remove my student class in implementation so we don't get confused by it and I'll now add fields which represent the student's information. So, I, so we said we'd have a first name, we'd have a last name, we'd have, what else? An age, and we'd have a hometown. Okay, so we have these four fields. How can we initialize them easily for our student class? Well, we can create a constructor which gets these fields as parameters. Now, instead of me writing the constructor, would be which would be something like student, which accepts string uh, for string first name and then string last name and so on, and then saying this dot first name equals first name and this dot last name equals last name and so on. Instead of writing this manually, here's what I can do. I can say Alt C code this code menu here. So alt C, we need to wait a bit because our code, uh, because our IntelliJ almost crashed again. Oh, and our cursor disappeared, great. Because why not? Anyway, uh, let's hope it gets back. Let's minimize it and yeah. So if your IntelliJ cursor disappears for some reason, minimize IntelliJ and maximize it again. Debugging, that's what we programmers do. Okay, so. Uh, what do we do here? We want to create a constructor. Now what I can do is either out code generate and here I can say constructor and I can mark which fields I want that constructor to initialize and I say okay and look what it did. It created a public constructor for me which accepts first name, last name, age and hometown and sets them automatically to my fields. So IntelliJ is smart and it does stuff for you like that. Although my suggestion would be try to write them on your own for for a start. Make this um, make this automatic in your mind. So you, you need to be able to write a constructor without thinking. So practice them a lot. But if you're in a hurry for some reason, like I am because we have limited time in the lecture, uh, then in that case well just uh, use the generators in IntelliJ okay guess what you can also generate uh, you press alt and insert which is the shortcut for code generate so we come over here and we press alt and insert or maybe it won't work oh yeah it works and now we can generate getters or setters or any of these other combinations now I won't generate them now because I'm not sure what I'll be needing yet. For certain I'd be needing the hometown though, right? Because I'd be, I'd have logic which says, okay, so if you re receive a city name and that by that city name list all people inside that city and list their first name and their last name and their age, well pretty much everything. So I need a getter for the hometown and I also need getters for the first name, last name and age. So let's generate all of them while we're at it. So we go over here, we press Alt and insert. We say getters and we want getters for everything. And it generated our getters the same way we would have. And again, I'd suggest that you write these on your own for starters until you have it so automatic in your mind that it's just wasting time to write them manually and then start generating them like this. It's good practice to be able to write getters and setters and it's pretty quick to learn. So for, for starters, unless you're at an exam, like write them on your own. When you're at an exam, use the auto-generation of code. 
Okay, so here we have the getters. We won't write setters for now. We'll think about how we can uh, change our objects and then we'll figure out what we can do. So, until when should we, should we read? Until we reach end. Okay, so we will have input and that input should be read piece by piece until we reach the string end. Okay, so how do we do that? Let's leave our list of students here because we would need it, but we won't be reading a count. We'd be reading with a while loop because we'd be reading until we reach the string end. Okay, so we would have the following. We would have a string which is um, input and we'd read this input. So I'd say scanner dot next, which just gives me the next string. I'd read the next string and I'd say while input equals end, but I don't want it to be equals. I want it to be not equals. This is my end condition when it becomes equal to end. Uh, while this is true, while it isn't end, and I'd actually need to uh, set it with the scanner, the scanner dot next value I need to put into the input uh, string. Okay, so if the input is different than end, what do I do? Well, if it's different than end, then it's the first name, right? So since I'm getting the input as first name, last name, age, hometown, at some point I'm going to get end. So if I reach end as the first symbol and in the input, uh, the first part of the input, then we've ended. Otherwise, it's the first name. If I've not reached the end, I've read, I've just read the first name as that input. Okay, so the first name is the input. So I can directly start creating my student object. What does the, my student object want? It wants its first name. Control P pops out this information about the parameters. So the input is my first name, the input I've just read. And my last name is scanner.next, read the next thing. And the, the age is scanner.next integer. And the hometown is scanner.next, read the next string. So read another string. And this is the student I just read from the input. Okay, now I have, let's do the simple thing. Because I have an additional uh, concept here in which if I receive a student twice, I need to overwrite it. Okay, but instead of overwriting it, I'll just add them all for for starters and then I'll figure out how to start overwriting them. So what do I do with the student? Well, I just say students.add that student. Okay, so I've read this part of the input and there's another part of the, oh, I haven't. What am I missing here? Well, I'm missing reading the input again, the, the first thing in the input again, because I've read it once, then I've read the last name, then I've read the age, then I've read uh, the hometown, and then for this loop to change, the input has to change. So I need to do another input equals scanner.next. Just next. Next reads the next string to where that, wherever that string reaches. Now, if uh, I have them on different lines, well, that may be a problem. Okay, why, why may it be a problem? Because this next at the end will read the last string. And then after it, what would I have? I'd have a new line, maybe. Let's check it out. I'm not actually completely sure whether next would stop uh, at the new line or will just uh, read until the next actual thing different than, a, uh, different than a separating character. So let's try it. Actually, I can navigate to it probably and see what it does. Uh, finds and returns the next complete token from the scanner. A complete token is preceded and followed by input that matches the delimiter pattern. What is that delimiter pattern? We don't know or we actually might find out by testing it. Okay, let's actually test it. Let's leave the code as it is. I'm not completely sure if it will work the way it is, but so what if it doesn't? Okay, let's now read the next thing from the input, which would be scanner dot next which is the search city right that's what they wanted us to uh, do read a city name for which we have to search okay so this is the string uh, city name for which we have to search and now we need to print only the students which have that city 
well that would mean that we need to iterate all of the students so students iterate for each student in these students after I've read the city name and know which city I want to print for I want to print something formatted on the console system.out.printf now what's that formatted thing I want to print to the console well I'll mark this code so I want these symbols over here and I want these symbols printed inside inside this formatted string and what parameters are, am I going to supply well I'm going to supply student dot get first name and student dot get last name and student dot get age okay so that's my formatted string now I just need to replace these symbols here with the appropriate formatting uh, tokens for printing the first name last name and age so the first name and the last name are strings and the age is an integer meaning digits so this is what I need to print now I don't need to print all of these students I need to print only the students which what which match the city name so for which the hometown matches the city name which I just read so this is the city name I just read and where is the hometown well I say if city name the thing I just read equals the this students get hometown then I, I'd be printing only these students I don't want to print any other students except the ones that have m the matching hometown okay well now what I'm mis missing is first let's see if this next thing work, works correctly because it may not uh, I'm not sure what would what it would do at the end of the input and the other thing I'm missing is overwriting existing students but since I don't want to implement everything at once I want to implement piece by piece and then uh, after I am certain that each piece works correctly then I want to implement the other pieces in this case the overwriting I'll just start the code up to here and place a breakpoint after the reading so after the reading I will examine my students list and see if they contain the correct values if they don't then I'll figure out how to fix it okay so starting this I'll stop the current execution and I'll start this execution so my format I can get from here so I get first name last name age and hometown okay so let's get this format and uh, paste it here and ju just change to something realistic so let's say George George F it's really been hard for me a lot of times to read my name in English my family name especially it's a re weird pronunciation when you go for English okay so I'm 27 and my hometown is Gabrovo okay so and I'll even copy this so I can reuse it for another student for which I'll just change the name okay so I press enter and then immediately I'll press end okay so let's see if I read correctly so the input here got to end let's see if the student if the students list contains me okay first name George Georgiev age 27 hometown Gabriel okay this looks correct okay let's test it again with two students because two students might mess something up uh, starting the code pasting my information and I'll press uh, and I'll add somewhere else Peter Peterson and let's say he's 92 from somewhere no from uh, the middle of nowhere and he's named not uh, Peter but courage and I won't I won't name it any further because I'll infringe copyright in some way but you probably got the idea of what I'm trying to input okay so ending the input here let's see if the students are correct so the first student I already know is correct because I saw it in the previous uh, attempt and in this uh, whether let's see whether the first student is correct well first name is courage okay that's correct last name is Peterson that's correct the age is 92 which is also correct and the hometown is the middle of nowhere okay that works okay so let's continue on from here uh, what does the code want well it expects me to enter a city name so let's see if I list Gabrovo Gabrovo 
whether it would correctly list all of these uh, students which have Gabriel, which is in this case only one student. Okay, so I press enter and I see George Georgiev is 27 years old. And I notice that again, I've forgotten the new line here, but otherwise the code is correct. Okay, so I managed to read uh, students from the console. I managed to print the ones of them that have a specific hometown. And what's left is to have logic which replaces uh, the information if a student repeats itself. So if I get myself again, if I get George again, and George changes its uh, city to Sofia, then I need to have George Georgiev change its city to Sofia in the data store, in the list of students. Okay, how do I do that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. I just need to find the student. And if that student exists, then I change them. I, I overwrite them with the new student. So what I do is if, it's actually not an if, it's I want to iterate all the students. And if the student already exists, I need to replace it. Otherwise, I need to add it. So I'll do the following. I can do a loop which sets a Boolean variable, which tells me if the student was found in the list. But then I need to search for them again, because, you know, searching for them again would yield the index at which they are, so I can overwrite them. Instead of that, I do the following. Int index of the student. So student index equals minus one. So minus one isn't a valid index, right? What I'm doing here is I'll start a for loop starting from i equals zero to i less than uh, students dot size. And now what I'll do is I'll say uh, if the student at this position, let's say uh, this is the check student, the student I'm checking, students dot give me that student students dot give me the student at that index. So this is the check student. And now I'm checking uh, if the check student, uh, if their first name equals the student I just read from the console's first name, get first name, and the check student's last name equals the student I just read from the console's last name, if those if both of these are true, then what I do is I'd say the student index equals uh, the index at which I'm at currently. So what am I doing? I'm initializing a student index that is invalid. However, while iterating the existing students, I check whether some of those students has the same first name and last name as the student I just read from the console. And if that's true, then that student index will change to the index. So student index will change from uh, to something from zero to students dot size minus one, one of these. So at this point, if my student index is uh, still equal to minus one, then I haven't, haven't found a match. So I just need to add the new student. However, if my student index isn't different isn't minus one, meaning that the student index is either zero or one or so on until students dot size minus one, then I need to replace that student. So I'd say students at that position, so set that position, which is the student index, to the new student that has been read from the console. So I overwrite the existing student with the new student I just read from the console instead of copying the student at the end of the input. Okay, so that's one way to uh, one way to solve this task, and I'll show an, show you another way before we end this lesson. So let's input the data. Here's George. Here's uh, Courage Peterson, and now I'll input George again, and I'll place end here, and I'll uh, ask for it to list uh, the number of students with Gabriel. If my filtering was correct, uh, I if my checks were correct, that is, I'd only see one George Georgiev in Gabriel. Okay, so enter now.
Giorgio GF is 27 years old. Okay, great. So now let's do a change. Let's start it again and see if if this uh, part of the logic changes. So let's say George Georgiev Gabrovo and now George Georgiev with the age of 28, let's say I had a birthday, which I didn't have yet, luckily, because I don't want to be 28 yet. I'm not ready for that. But uh, in this case, what would happen, what we expect to happen is when I try to list students in Gabrovo, I'd see George Georgiev 28, not 27. Okay, let's see if that works. And and now I say Gabrovo, press enter, and yes, George Georgiev got changed to 28 years old. Now, a different solution to this task, instead of using indices, I could do the, the following. I could create a student, which is, um, let's say, this is found student, because I found it in the data store, and I'll set it to no. And instead of setting the index, I'd say the found student equals the check student. So this is, and I, I by the way, I need, I need a break here, correct? It's not really necessary, but if I add the break here, that's uh, true for the index search as well. If I add the break here, I'll save some uh, operations, which I don't need. I don't need this for loop to run, uh, to check all the students. At the moment it sees a student which matches, it needs to stop there because there can't be another student that matches because we always, uh, replace matching students. Okay, so notice what I'm doing here. I'm setting a found student which is equal to no. Any object, you've seen this from strings, but any object, uh, student, list, uh, string, uh, local date, and so on, can be set to no. This means it has no value. This means you can't access fields of it or anything. It's just a representation of a lack of value. So nothing exists here. And here I say, okay, if I find if I if I find him, make this found student point to the check student, meaning point to whichever student index was in students dot size. So now I'm accessing, now I'm pointing to the student itself. Remember that, like we had for methods, there are value types and reference types. Value types are all integers and doubles and floats and so on. However, uh, strings and arrays and lists and other objects like this one are reference types meaning that when i do this i'm not getting a copy here i'm getting the same object so i'm pointing to the same object this becomes just an alias of this object a pseudonym so this would point to the check student so the original one that's inside the list and now what can i do i can say okay if found student equals no just add the new student right because nothing changes okay so no not that nothing changes but no, we haven't found anyone so this student which we're we've just added is unique however if the found student isn't no what we can do is instead of replacing the entire object in the list we can do the following we can say the found student dot set name and now we don't have a setter so let's add that setter let's insert two setters for uh actually not name what what do we change the name and the first name and the last name are the same so what do we need to change we need to change the age and the hometown so i insert setters for both of these and now i say found student dot set set age and i get the student i just read age and I do the same for hometown. Found student set hometown, and I use the student I just read from the inputs, get hometown. So this will do the exact same thing. Even though we're not replacing an item in the list, we're just accessing an existing item in that list by its reference, because it's a reference data type. So this thing points to the original inside students uh, at the appropriate index, and this changes that item directly instead of replacing it with a new item. So this is another way you can do this. This is another way you can, uh, you can overwrite the values. Instead of overwriting the entire object, you just change the values of the existing object. And this code will do the exact same thing which we had previously. Let's copy the input, start it again, and paste it back into the console. Pasting it here, pressing enter, 
George Georgiev is 28 years old. As we expected, we changed the object instead of inserting a new one. Okay, so that's the task I wanted to solve with you and I also demonstrated how you can uh, change uh, objects and look for objects in lists. And actually this is something pretty common. Uh, a lot of programming, like pr pretty much 50% of programming in the real, real world, is just looking for objects in some data store or another, like our list, or another data storage type like a map, a set, or something else. Looking for objects, finding them as quickly as possible, changing something with, of their values or removing them or um, inserting something in their place or inserting something around them or uh, using their value or changing their value and so on. But a lot of software development is just looking through lists of objects or other data structures of objects and accessing them by some characteristic of that object or another. So this is a basic, a basic overview of what objects are. There's a lot more to learn about object-oriented programming and we've just scratched the surface, but scratching the surface like this allows you to study more about objects and classes at home if you wish, or to practice more of what we uh, did here and practice it again and again until it becomes second nature to you. So you can get comfortable with creating objects and using them and passing them around in methods and so on. So this is just an introduction and we will be using them uh, in the following lectures and we will get to know them a bit better by just seeing them in different contexts. But this should be enough for now for you to uh, use them efficiently. So what do we know up to this point? That classes define, I'd call them blueprints for objects. And these blueprints consist of fields, of constructors, of properties and of methods. Now properties here is just um, fields combined with their getters and setters. That's what we mean by properties. And these objects which uh, the classes instantiate, so using the blueprints from a class, we create objects and these objects have a state. That state is just the value which has the names set by the class. So an object has fields, these fields have values, and that's what we call the object state. That state can change using setters and, uh, and other methods or just by directly accessing the fields of the object. And these objects are just instances of classes the same ways that variables are instances of data types. And that's all we needed to discuss for today. I hope this was useful for you. Don't forget to ask your questions in all the communications ch channels we've offered to you. And see you again next time. Did you like this lesson? Do you want more? Join the Werner's community at softunit.org. Subscribe to my YouTube channel to get more free video tutorials on coding and software development. Get free access to the practical exercises and the automated judge system for this coding lesson and many others. Get free help from mentors and meet other learners. Join now, it's free. Softuni.org